Yes, lo-fi country. Yes, that's what we'll be listening to while we start our adventure through trigger warning. <sighs> Let me tell you a story. A story about a public servant named Jake Rears. All right, to kick us off here, I'll, uh, let me read the, uh, this, this might be too, I don't know if this might be too, too relaxing. We'll see. Shit, this might put me to sleep. All right, to kick things off, also, just as a, just to chronicle this for all time, I just came from the dentist. My, the right half of my face is numb, so this is gonna, this is gonna put a color on the performance to begin with. But uh, I'll try my best. Um, I'll try as hard as William W. Johnstone with J. A. Johnstone did, writing trigger warning. All right, let me let me first read the back back of the book here. Johnstone country, where others fear to tread. From the best-selling authors of the Doomsday Bunker, Black Friday, and Stand Your Ground, comes the explosive story of a college under siege and freedom under fire. And then in all caps, centered, political correctness won't save you. Former Army Ranger Jake Rivers is not your typical Kelton College student. He's not spoiled, coddled, or ultra-lib like his classmates who sneer at the soldier boy. Rivers is not triggered by microaggressions. He is not outraged by male privilege and cisgender bathrooms. He does not need a safe space period or coloring books period little wise authors know when you can bend the rules of grammar jake needs an education and when terror strikes the school needs jake without warning the sounds of gunfire plunge the campus into a battle zone a violent gang of marauders invade the main hall taking students as hostages for big Ransom money. As a veteran and patriot, Jake won't give in to their demands. But to fight back, he needs to enlist his fellow classmates to school these special snowflakes in the not-so-liberal art of war. This time the aggression isn't micro, it's life or death, and only the strong survive. Oh yeah, also I pointed this out before, but it's very important. The back of the book says, live free, read hard. In all caps. Ah. Super duper man. Thanks for the sub. Thank you very much. Trigger warning. Oh, wait, hold on. Look for these heart pounding thrillers by William W. Johnstone, writing with J.A. Johnstone wherever books are sold. So, Doomsday Bunker, Black Friday, Tyranny, Stand Your Ground, Suicide Mission, The Bleeding Edge, The Blood of Patriots, Home Invasion. Jackknife, Remember the Alamo, Invasion USA, Invasion USA is a, is a sick movie with Chuck Norris, anyway, Invasion USA colon Border War, oh, uh, yeah, it's a Toy Soldiers fanfic, pretty much, except the, the students are gonna win, uh, Vengeance is Mine, Phoenix Rising, and then Phoenix Rising Firebase Freedom, and Phoenix Rising, Day of Judgment. Oh man, Firebase Freedom rocks. Okay, chapter one. I think I need to reposition my mic a little bit. Okay, chapter one. A short, sharp cry in the night made Jake Rivers look up from the book he was reading. To be honest, he was glad for the distraction. He was on the verge of throwing the book against the wall of his dorm room in disgust. Since it was a hard copy, a thick trade paperback he had bought in the university bookstore for an outrageous price, and not something he was reading on his phone or tablet, he could have done that without breaking anything. Although the book was heavy enough, it might have dented the sheetrock. Sheetrock is capitalized for some reason. A sheetrock? A proper noun? Yell ho! Thank you for gifting a sub. Okay, sheetrock. The window next to Jake's desk was open to let in the warm autumn air. 
Olmsted Hall had been built more than 70 years earlier before air conditioning and updated and remodeled many times. But the windows still opened, which Jake liked. He dropped a book on the desk, switched off the lamp he'd been using for light, and stood up to move closer to the window. From here on the second floor, he had a good view of Navsger... Navsger? Navsger Plaza, yeah. The large park-like area in the center of Kelton College's campus. Three residence halls, Pearsall, Olmsted, and Callahan, run north to south, bordered the western side of the plaza. The administration building was at the northern end. The main science building, Terrell Hall, to the south. The Big Burr Memorial Library was directly across from where Jake looked out the window. He could see the lights along the front of it through the trees. He spotted movement in the shadows under those trees. Someone ran towards the dorms along one of the concrete walks. But another figure pursued and caught the first one, grabbing an arm to sling the fleeing person to the ground. Another cry. Definitely female. Jake had some more reading to do for class, as much as he despised the book he had just tossed onto the desk, but it could wait. He headed for the door of his room. He wasn't really aware of it, but he was smiling as he went out. It didn't take him long to get down the stairs. A group of students was sitting in the lobby talking about something. He heard the words microaggression and privilege and cisnormative. But Jake didn't even glance at them as he went by, and none of them called out to him. He didn't have any friends here, and whatever the subject under discussion, none of them wanted his opinion on it. He was just a big dumb brute, after all. As he strode quickly out into the night, keen eyes searched the area under the trees where he had seen the two figures a couple of minutes earlier. At first he didn't see anything, then he spotted movement again. There. Damn it, Annie, be, just be reasonable. I'm not going to let go of you until you start thinking straight. Stop it, Craig, just stop! The words gasped out as the woman clearly fought to hold back sobs. I told you it was over! Jake was still moving towards them, but he stopped as he heard what the woman said. A grimace tugged at his mouth. Lovers quarrel. None of his business. That was an old-fashioned attitude, and he knew it. But almost everything about him was old-fashioned, including his dislike of a woman being mistreated. Of course, if he did step in to help her, more than likely she would stick up for her boyfriend and turn on him instead, accusing him of perpetuating the patriarchy and the myth of women needing to be rescued. He already got enough of that crap every day. He started to turn away. Then the son of a bitch had to go and slap her. Jake heard the crack of open hand on flesh and stopped in his tracks. He swung around, took several more steps until he could see the two of them fairly well in some stray beams of light filtering through the trees from the library. Couldn't make out too many details because the light wasn't that good. But she was petite and blonde, while the guy was good-sized with dark hair and a short beard. Something was odd about the shape of his head, and after a second, Jake got it. The guy's hair was long enough that he'd piled it up into a bun on the top of his head. Yeah, Real House, this is laid on real thick. It's great. Jake, uh... So you got a man bun going on. Jake ran the left hand over his... Well, Jake ran his left hand over his own buzz cut. He'd had, a fa he'd had fairly long hair once. Half a dozen years earlier. But he'd never worn it in a bun. And if he ever grew it back out, he still wouldn't. <laughs> Great. Good to know. The guy started tugging on the woman who was actually crying now. Jake said, That's enough, Craig. Let her go. That's going to be my Jake Rivers voice for now. Both of them jumped a little in surprise. Jake moved pretty quietly all the time without thinking about it anymore. More than once, people had accused him of sneaking up on them when all he was doing was minding his own business. Oh man, don't do that. Do I know you? Nope. I just heard you from my window up there. Jake gestured vaguely toward Olmsted Hall. Well, you got super hearing or something? We weren't being that loud. Sorry if we bothered you, man. We'll keep it down. Anyway, we're just on our way back to our place. We'll be gone in a second. It's not our place, the woman said. Annie. 
That's what Craig had called her. It's my apartment. You need to get your stuff and leave. I'm not going anywhere. Craig snapped. That Julica's girl's been feeding your head full of crap. Anyway, she just wants you for herself. You know that, don't you? He still had hold of Annie's arm. Jake said, you haven't let go of her. Craig looked around. Craig looked around at him and said in an annoyed tone, Are you still there? This is none of your business, man. He paused. Are you one of the football players? Chilton College had a football team, but it hadn't won a game in three years. You're big enough, but Olmstead's not the athletic dorm. I'm not a football player, and you need to let go of the lady. <laughs> you don't have to call me a lady, Annie said, just as Jake had expected. She sounded halfway offended. Sorry. I gotta take a little, little breather. The feeling is starting to come back into my tongue, which is a really weird experience. <sighs> you don't need to call me a lady. I'm trying to help you. That's no excuse for perpetuating stereotypes and spreading toxic masculinity. That's exactly what she said back. Jake couldn't hold back a sigh. Even scared and in trouble, Annie couldn't stop herself from parroting some of the garbage that had been forced into her head. Not for the first time in the past half dozen years since he'd enlisted, Jake found himself wondering if the people he fought to defend really deserved it. He'd always concluded that they did, but sometimes it wasn't easy to convince himself. Craig said, All right, we're going. He turned and tried to pull Annie along with him. No, she said. Let me go. You heard her, Jake said as he stepped closer. Craig finally released Annie's arm, but only so he could ball that hand into a fist. He twisted toward Jake and threw a punch. Jake moved his head out of the way and said, Stop it, man, while you still can. I'm not scared of you, Craig shouted. I don't care how big you are. I know Krav Maga. He had just started some sort of fancy martial arts move when Jake hit him with the left hook to the belly. Usually you don't hook the belly. How do you hook a belly? You can't. Unless he's turned to the side, I guess. Anyway. Craig's eyes got so wide, Jake could see... The whites of them, even in the bad light. As he started to double over, Jake swung a right cross to the jaw that snapped Craig's head over. Craig went down hard, pounding his face against the concrete walk. You killed him! And he screeched. No, I could have. But I just knocked him out. Didn't even break his jaw. He'll be alright. She came at him, hissing and spitting. Jake didn't know many cops. But he'd had known some MPs and they felt the same as their civilian counterparts about handling domestic disturbances. Those calls were the worst, and this encounter was a living example of it. All he'd tried to do was help this woman, and now she wanted to claw his eyes out because he'd hit her boyfriend. He should have stayed with that weighty tome about how capitalism was the worst economic system, and America was the most evil country in the world. Instead, he had to raise his arm to fend off the punches she was throwing at him. Although the blows were ineffective enough, he probably could have just stood there and taken them without any harm being done. You! You fascist! She screamed. You oppressor! Hell, lady, Jake said, knowing the word would get under her skin again. How'd you know I used to be in the army? He decided he might as well turn and walk away and let her do her worst. He was about to do that when Craig groaned. The sound made Annie break off her attack and drop to her knees beside him. She lifted him into a half-sitting position and held him against her. He seemed like he was still too groggy to know what was going on. Jake heard a sudden rush of footsteps behind him and turned to see several black-clad figures charging him. He couldn't make out their faces. And when they yelled, FASCIST! FASCIST! 
The words were, the words were muffled. He knew why. They were wearing hoods over their heads. Then they were on him, swinging bicycle chains with locks on them, metal pipes, and other objects turned into clubs. And this peaceful night on the small, elite college campus turned into a fight for his life. Yeah, I think Antifa just showed up. That's the end of chapter one. That's the end of chapter one. Are there gangs on campus? Yes, there are feral liberal gangs. And that's how the, the kind of, that's how the story starts. If I, like, I don't want to spoil anything, but what I remember of the book is he whips all their asses and then he goes to school the next day where he has like a, I don't remember how long it takes for him to meet the like alabaster skinned, red haired and green eyed female insert that just finds him oh so charming and interesting because he's a real man kind of thing. Uh, anyway, thanks for all the subs so far. Okay, guess what everyone, everything, every, I was about to say, everything's at 100% now. I've eaten, uh, the trackers appear to be working now. Uh, I, I do think that they missed a huge chunk though, so I'm going to, let me update it here. I'll just put it to like, put it to that, because I, I think that's about right. And then we'll bump the timer here. Okay, but I've eaten. Do uh, you still have the time extended animation? I have a few different ones, yeah. None of them are thematic to, to today's stream, though. Uh, I didn't have time to make anything. But that's okay. We're, at, we're in chapter two. We're in chapter two now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you again for all of your, uh, your support. Uh, hour and fire hour engage. Exactly. Uh, chapter two. Okay, so for people who missed the first chapter, Jake was reading in his room a book about how capitalism and America are bad. He was tired of reading it because that just does not, he just doesn't agree with it. Uh, a woman was getting assaulted outside, so we went outside to help her. She screamed at him for being a fascist and a, and a patriarchal fascist. Who was Jake? Our former army ranger, Jake Rivers. He's here for an education. Yeah, oppressor. She screamed at him. Uh, yeah, Craig, the man bun, was, was slapping his girlfriend, um, who they, they dropped a line about them being in like a poly relationship too. Uh, and Jake Rivers was like, Hey, none of my business. I'm just an army guy trying to get a, a living, man. Don't bother me. But then he slapped her. Uh oh. So he's like, Okay, now it's time to get involved. Some people don't like that about me, that I like to get involved sometimes when I see something bad happening. So, uh, Jake very directly and masculinely told him to stop. Craig did not. Craig swung at Jake. A big mistake. Jake punched him in the stomach, knocked him out cold in the face. Then he started getting attacked by Emily. She had a name, shockingly. The, the woman who was being attacked here. Uh, Annie. Annie. So Jake's just like, whatever, Pfft, he doesn't even care. <clears throat> they say a couple of times that Annie's, Annie's attacks were meaningless to Jake. He, he, might, he might as well have walked away. And he started to, but then figures jumped out. Figures jumped out of the bush, calling him a fascist. They had bike chains with uh, locks on them. Guess what? Here comes Antifa. They're wearing hoods. So here we go. Chapter two. Weezer, thank you for the sub. Hey. Oh, the timer didn't. Oh, come on, bro. Hold on a second. There we go. Wait. Yeah, there we go. Great. Okay. 
I think it kind of, I think that was my fault. If I have it open on multiple tabs, I think it gets a little wacky, but. Okay. Chapter two. Jake had battled against superior odds many times. Oh, so yeah, sorry. That, that is confusing if only you were just watching that. It went from 46 to 26 because it wrapped around, if that makes sense. It was, it was stuck and it had lost like 10 subs or so. So I added it and it rolls around, but anyway, it makes sense, right? Because I actually added a lot of subs to it. That's actually it refreshing. It was stuck before. It makes sense. Just trust in the system. That's all I got to do. All right. Chapter two. Uh, <laughs> okay. Jake had battled superior odds many times, but usually he'd been heavily armed and hadn't been forced to take his enemies on barehanded. The thing to do in a situation like that was to take an opponent's weapon away from him, which is what Jake did when one of the black-clad attackers swung a pipe at his head. He ducked, let the pipe go over his head, and then came up with his left forearm under the guy's chin, forcing his head back sharply. Okay, real quick though. If actually it is, if actually like people have been watching and I'm super wrong, please let me know if I'm erasing people's subs. But I thought, I thought that was the case. I thought it was stuck on the overlay. All right. Let me know if I'm wrong. I might be wrong. Not sharply enough to break the idiot's neck though. He always knows exactly how much to beat these guys up. These were kids, arrogant, small-minded bullies, but still kids. They didn't deserve to die for being stupid enough to believe the pack of lies they had been fed by their teachers, the media, Hollywood, and more than half of Washington, D.C. When this was written, Republicans owned every single wing of, of, of government, by the way. Tossing that out there. Jake reached up, closed his right hand around the pipe, and wrenched it free of the attacker's grip. He twirled it, jabbed the end into the kid's stomach, and sent him staggering backwards, gagging and retching. Moving too fast to see in the shadows, Jake let his instincts and a faintly heard sound guide him. He lifted the pipe as another of the figures slashed at him with a chain. The chain wrapped around the pipe and Jake used it to jerk the guy toward him. Jake's left fist shot out in a straight jab that popped the cartilage in the guy's nose. He howled in pain. Jake pivoted, swung pipe and chain, and collided the chain, or coiled the chain around another guy's ankle. Another attacker's ankle, excuse me. A quick tug yanked the guy's legs out from under him and dropped him hard on his back on the concrete. That knocked all the breath out of him and left him gasping for air. A second later, somebody landed on Jake's back and wrapped wiry arms and legs around him. I got him! A female voice yelled, Kill the fascist! Down with the pressers! Kill him! The pipe and chain clattered on the walk as Jake dropped them. He reached up and back, got hold of the attacker clinging to his back like a spider monkey, and tore her loose. She didn't weigh much. He bent forward, swung her over his head, and tossed her onto the ground, being careful to make sure she didn't land on the concrete or hit a tree. She screeched, RAPE! RAPE! As she rolled over on the grass, and he wished for a second that he hadn't been quite so careful. Antifa! Antifa! The chanting made him look around. He frowned as he saw that the commotion had attracted several dozen students. His frown deepened as he realized they were cheering on the black-clad attackers. Wait a minute, he shouted, knowing he was wasting his time, but too angry right now to care. I didn't do anything wrong. I was just trying to help a woman. Toxic! Toxic racist Nazi! The whole world had gone freaking crazy, he thought. The black suits were on their feet again and regrouping. As they got ready to charge him, Jake flashed back for an instant to things he had seen in the past. Men in black hoods spouting Arabic as they held a western journalist and sawed his head off with a big knife. More black hooded figures forcing a scared child 
with a bomb strapped to him down a street while they threatened to kill his mother if he didn't blow himself. <laughs> Sorry. If he didn't blow up himself, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> Gotta slow down, I'm getting too excited here. This is, this is intense shit, man. If he didn't blow up himself and some American soldiers, those same evil men or others just like them, shouting at him and his buddies. Then the memories went back even further to old grainy historical newsreel footage he had seen. Row upon row of young men in spiffy uniforms and high black boots, marching through the streets of a city, lifting their arms in a salute to the madman in front of whom they passed in review, on the way to wipe out anyone who didn't think exactly the same way they did. They had disarmed the citizenry, taken over all the newspapers and radio and colleges and universities, and made it a crime punishable by death to say or even think anything they disagreed with. And the mass graves and the smoke rising from the crematoriums, and later an even worse evil rising in the east, with millions more, <laughs> with millions dead, for no reason other than opposing what the party leaders said and did. The starvation, the booted marchers coming down the street, the knock on the door in the night, followed by wails of grief and anguish. And these people surrounding him now, the bullies in their black hoods, and the ones who chanted for them, believed in and supported that hideous evil while calling him a Nazi and a fascist. They kept using those words, Jake thought wryly, as all that flashed through his mind, but he didn't believe the words meant what the people thought they did. Then they charged him again. Jake reached down and picked up the pipe and chain. He unwrapped the chain, held it in his left hand, and clutched the pipe in his right. On the Road Productions, thank you for the sub. Oh wait, we got ads. Hold on a second. We'll take an ad break. That's okay, this is a good lull moment. That's about to get intense. He's just flashed back to every historical atrocity ever and said that said that liberals are exactly like that. As all this is flashing through his mind, a gang of feral liberals is about to descend on him to tear him apart for being different. You hawk show forever? Thank you for gifting a sub. Ooh. Oh, milk. Oh, you. Is this stream going to turn into a honeypot? Business Otter, thanks for gifting a sub. Okay, let's see. My, my book slid off my lap, so I have, to, I have to find where I am again. Okay, ads are, ads are almost done. This is a different kind of conservative wet dream, Alicia. Yes, a different entirely. This is about an army ranger who is... Uh, He's got a, he's got a clean, he's, he's just not allowed to live. He just wants a life of peace. Oh, geez. Okay. Let's see here. All right. So he's about to get charged at by a whole gang of rabid Antifa. Orpheus, thank you for, thank you for the sub. Hey, I am, I am your, I am your grind pal. That's what I'm here for. All right, they were calling him a Nazi and a fascist. They kept using those words, Jake thought wryly, as all that flashed through his mind, but he didn't believe the words meant what these people thought they did. Then they charged him again. Jake reached down and picked up the pipe and chain. He unwrapped the chain, held it in his left hand, and clutched the pipe in his right. He was sick and tired of this. Maybe it was time he actually fought back, no matter what the consequences. Drop him! Drop those weapons, damn it! The shouted command came from behind him. He turned, saw the half-dozen uniformed campus cops converging on him. He said, wait, I'm not the one. Phelps, deploy taser! He heard a small gunfire, felt the fierce jab as the first set of needles pierced his shirt and lanced into his flesh to deliver their jolt of electricity. He staggered as the shock coursed through him, but he didn't go down. Carter, taser! Another set of probes hit him and seemed to turn the blood in his veins and arteries into streams of fire. 
agony racked him as his muscles clamped hard as stone. He knew that he was falling, but didn't feel it when he crashed to concrete. Consciousness fled from him. But not before he heard the gleeful, jeering cries from the spectators. Down with Nazis! Down with Nazis! And then there's a break. Line break. New scene. Damn it, Jake. What am I going to do with you? Frank McCraney leaned back in the chair behind his desk, sighed, and shook his head. He was the chief of campus police and clearly didn't appreciate being called to his office late in the evening like this when he should have been, home, should have been at home with his family. Jake sat in the chair in front of McCraney's desk. His muscles still ached a little from being hit with the stun guns, but he didn't show that discomfort in his face or his voice as he said, I don't know, sir. I'm sure there are plenty of people who think you should turn me over to the police or should have me arrested. The balding, baggy-eyed campus cop frowned and said, Was that right? Your fault? Well, there was one of me and how many of them? What conclusion would you draw from that, sir? Don't get mouthy, son. McCraney snapped. Then he couldn't help but chuckle. <laughs> At least you didn't kill any of them. There's that to be thankful for. God. I tried not to hurt anybody more than I had to. I was just trying to stop that guy Craig from hurting the girl. At first, and after that, I just defended myself. And quite efficiently, too, from what I hear, McCraney said, nodding. I'm not going to charge you with anything, not yet anyway. Once the activists and the lawyers and the media start putting pressure on President... What? Pelletier? Pelletier, there's no, t there's no telling what he'll insist on just to get them all off his back. Once the fucking media gets in here. <laughs> and Miser, thank you for gifting two subs. Yeah, French name. Weak. Pelletier. Exactly. Probably wears a stupid fucking jacket. Like a business jacket. Stupid idiot. Baby. Huh. Jenny Nicholson ad where she reads trigger warning. No, but that, is that this? Maybe we're all, we're all experiencing... The, the same delightful media. <laughs> Needs Jake to get him pictures of Spider-Man. <laughs> oh. oh, god damn. Okay. He, he, the police chief, took his phone out of his shirt pocket, tapped a few icons on it, then turned the screen to Jake. Or turned the screen so Jake could read the headline on the news site... The older man had called up, in all caps, far right extremist attacks college students. That's not even close to correct, Jake said. I didn't attack anybody. I just defended myself, like I told you. And I'm not far right, far left, or far anything else. I just want to go to school and get an education, sir. You've been here two months. <laughs> I bet you get more of an education than you have a bargain for. McCraney put away his phone, then leaned forward and clasped his hands together on the desk. Why are you here, Jake? Is it because of your grandfather? <laughs> the accent's just gonna come and go. It's fine. <laughs> Jake hesitated. Most people here at Kelton didn't know who his grandfather was. Oh, of course he's fucking connected. Fucking asshole. Gotta be a war hero though, right? But McCraney was a family friend and had known Cordell Gardner as a young man. McCraney had known Jake's father, Philip, too. He just didn't speak of him. Neither did Jake. <laughs> the grandpa, Robert E. Lee. God damn. <laughs> uh, uh. Now he's gotta be like a he's gotta be hidden royalty, right? That's part of the part of the fantasy, is that you're secretly destined for greatness, but you still have to be a you still have to work as a common man. Jake didn't even use his father's name anymore. He had changed his name legally to Rivers, his mother Donna's maiden name. He had worried a little about what Cordell would think about that, but the old man not only hadn't been offended, he had encouraged Jake to make that move, just as he encouraged him to join the army and then come here to Kelton College. Problem was, the army wasn't what it once had been, and Kelton College sure as hell wasn't. Jake... 
McCraney prodded. But Jake was lost in the past. Sha. That's the end of chapter two, which begins six months earlier. So we got our little taste of action. Jake Rivers beat up some people. He like freaking wrapped a chain around a pipe and then swung it around somebody else's ankle and then yanked him to the ground. Cool stuff. And now we get to understand Jake Rivers the man by understanding his history six, six months into the past. The book just keeps layering on. Yeah, Antifa showed up to chant poorly. What's the name of this garbage? Trigger warning. Trigger warning. I'll just leave the I'll leave the alerts there for now. Okay, chapter three. You blew yourself up lighting a gas grill yesterday. All right. That's why the liberals are trying to take our gas away so that we can't hurt ourselves like true free Americans. Chapter three, six months earlier. Oh shit, Private Futter Whacking. Thanks for gifting out 25 subs. Um, damn, that's a lot. Thank you, Pepper. Thank you for the sub. That's going to make counting even harder. I think, I think it was like when, I think it was when Demi gave out eight that capped off another 50. So I'll try to, I'll try to count from there. I think I'm pretty sure. But yes. Thank you very much. That's a lot of subs. Okay. See now they're starting to trickle in a little bit. If I end up having to guesstimate, I'll try to like, I'll try to be generous. That's what I thought I was doing last time. I thought I tacked on like 15 subs. Okay. It started from your eight. Okay. And you want, you wanted to just hit the hour, right? So, okay. They're, I guess they're trickling in now. We'll, we'll see where it ends up. I, I can, I, I have a bookmark in my head sort of, of, uh, of the, the number. Anyway, sorry that this is taking up too much of our time. Let's get to the literature chapter three, six months earlier, Jake has been lost in a, a recollection of reverie. Uh, well, what else are you going to do with yourself, boy? Pull! Cordell Gardner tracked the clay pigeon with a shotgun, leading it perfectly as he squeezed the trigger. The pigeon exploded into small fragments as the buckshot hit it. I hadn't really thought about it, Jake said. He and his grandfather were standing at the edge of a large field that Cordell Gardner used for skeet shooting. The roof of the old man's house, which was big, but somehow not ostentatious, was visible over the trees behind him. Gardner's estate sprawled over a lot of East Texas acres and included tennis courts, stables, and a nine-hole golf course, even though Gardner didn't play tennis, ride horses, or have any use for golf. Sometimes his guests did, though, and he'd been raised to be hospitable. He broke the shotgun open, took fresh shells from his pocket, and thumbed them into the gun. You better start thinking about it, he told Jake. You didn't re-enlist, so now you have to do something else with your life. My life. Why? Jake asked bluntly. I could just sit around and wait for you to die so I'll inherit that fortune of yours. Gardner threw back his head and laughed. He was a big old man, though not as big as Jake's 6'4 and 250 pounds. Jake's a big boy. <laughs> The shock of hair on his head was snow white, which made the deep, permanent tan on his weathered face seem even darker than it really was. He had an air of vitality about him despite his age and seemed to be nowhere near dying. How do you know I haven't disowned you? <laughs> you wouldn't do that, Jake said. I'm too much like you. Gardner grunted. Might be a good reason to right there. Pull! One of the old man's groundkeepers, who also served as his assistant when he came out here to shoot, triggered the trap that flung a target into the air. Gardner blew it to pieces, then turned and held out the shotgun to Jake. Want to give it a try? You used to be pretty good at this. Jake took the gun and loaded it with the shells his grandfather handed him. He said, It's been a long time. Like riding a bicycle. It'll come right back to you. 
Gardner turned and looked at the groundskeeper. Send two this time, Benny. You want to make it tough on me? Jake asked. Just sit in a bar. That wasn't all of it. Jake knew the old man still had a strong competitive streak. He wasn't necessarily trying to show Jake up, but if Jake missed one or both of the targets, then his grandfather took the gun back and broke both the next time, he would get a considerable amount of satisfaction out of that. Jake was contrary enough that he didn't want to give the old man that much satisfaction. He set his stance, held the shotgun ready in the gun down position, and nodded. Pull! Gardner called. The targets flew spinning into the air. Jake brought the shotgun smoothly to his shoulder, tracked the leader, squeezed off one barrel, shifted his aim just slightly, and fired again. Tiny fragments of both targets pelted to the ground, all that was left of them. Gardner frowned and asked, How long has it been since you did any target shooting, boy? At targets like that, seven years, maybe eight. Gardner just shook his head in admiration. You got a knack for it, I always have. Never saw a boy could handle a gun like you, even when you were a little kid. You could shoot down a grown man when you were 12 years old, drive like a grown man when you were 14. I'd ask some of the mamas of your high school buddies what else you could do like a grown man, but I don't think I'd want to know. <laughs> Bagging milfs? <laughs> Rootin' tootin'? Milf shootin'? <laughs> He's so good at guns! <laughs> Holy shit. Ugh. Guns, cars, and milfs. Whoop, whoop. Jake handed back the shotgun and said, Driving just got me into trouble. Street racing, you mean? <laughs> Jake shrugged. Uh, who's talking right now? Okay. Jake shrugged. The cops frowned on it. I would have wound up in jail more than once if it weren't for you and your lawyers. This fucking guy. This bootstraps motherfucker. God. The book even admits he's like connected to money and he's protected. And he already has the gall to just be like these motherfucking soft motherfuckers. I'm such a hard ass. Of course. God. Anyway. Gardner pursed his lips and said, Yes, and it was a mistake saving you from your own foolishness. I should have let you spend some time behind bars. Might have taught you a lesson. But, <laughs> but at least I realized I was about to make the same mistakes with you that I made with your father and stopped in time just to keep you from ruin... Uh, and stopped just in time to keep from ruin ruining you the same way. God. Uh, I'm trying to go too fast. Jake didn't want to talk about his father, but the old man had brought it up. Most people don't consider it being ruined to be a rich, successful lawyer. His grandfather snorted. Most people never knew what a sorry, no-account scoundrel Philip Gardner really was. It pains me to say it, but he was... Junebug? In with the surprisingly thin blue line take from Barney? Scientists were the ones that are talking about global warming. Shut up, scientists! I'll eat my red meat. On my gas stove. Thank you for the cheer. Jeez. Ugh. Stupid scientists. Uh. Okay. <laughs> Most people never knew what a sorry, no account scoundrel Philip Gardner really was. It pains me to say it, but he was my son, so I've got the right. Of course, I blame myself. You didn't shove that cocaine up his nose. I might as well have. Jake turned. If all we're gonna do is blow clay pigeons out of the air and talk about a bunch of old crap, I'd just as soon forget. I'm out of here. Gardner went after him, put a hand on his arm. Wait, I, I just want to know what your plans are, Jake. Maybe I don't have any, Jake said, stopping and turning to look at his grandfather. Then why don't you go back to school and try to figure out what you want to do with your life? I know you too well, boy. You may joke about sitting around and doing nothing, but it's not in you. Never has been. Maybe the army didn't work out, but there's something else waiting out there for you. I know there is. Didn't work out, Jake repeated. Two tours in the Middle East and a chest full of medals and ribbons isn't working out. 
You did a good job, sure. A, a great job, even. But did it satisfy you? Jake scowled. The old man knew good and well that it hadn't. Something was still missing in his life. It always had been, no matter how many skills he mastered, no matter how much excitement and risk he sought out. But college? That was supposed to fulfill him? The idea was plain crazy. Look, I know you're smart, Gardner went on. You already had more than half a college degree in your pocket when you were a senior in high school. Yeah, and I never finished senior year, did I? Not because you couldn't have. Hell, you would have been the valedictorian. Salutatorian. Jake corrected him. That math team girl would have edged me out by a few percentage points. But it didn't matter. By graduation, I'd already enlisted to get out of trouble with the law. Your idea, as I recall. And you got your GED and your bachelor's degree before you got out. <laughs> That's a lot of work. As well as paying the system for all it's worth. Or playing, excuse me, playing the system. For all it's worth. You taught me well, Jake said with a smile. I'd like to think so, but now it's time to let somebody else teach you. You know I got ties to Kelton College. You built how many buildings and endowed how many fellowships and scholarships for them? Gardner made a dismissive gesture. I never had a chance to go to college, but I always wanted to. I've done all right for myself. A few billion dollars worth of all right. The old man waved that off, too. But maybe I would have done even better. More importantly, maybe I would have done even... More importantly, maybe I would have been an even better person with a real education. You can do that, boy. Get your master's degree. Hell, get your doctorate. He grinned. You could be Dr. Jacob Rivers. Doctor of what? I don't care. Whatever strikes your fancy. That's what college is for. To go and find out what you're good at and what you enjoy. And here I thought it was a place where parents paid thousands of dollars for the kids to get drunk, do drugs, and have sex. Maybe some of them. Gardner snapped. But it's not that way at Kelton. It's one of the finest academic institutions in the country. That's why a smart fellow like you will fit right in. You, you'll see, Jake. Just give it, a, give it a try. That's all I ask. It was hard for Jake to argue with his grandfather. When his parents had split up, Cordell Gardner had been a rock. Not only for Jake, but for his mother. Cordell was very fond of her as well. Okay. As bad as things had been, they would have been worse if Gardner hadn't been around. Jake really would have wound up in jail. His life a total waste like his dad's turned out to be. Kelton College, eh? That's right. It's in Greenleaf, outside of Austin. Greenleaf, Texas? This is actually in Texas? I did not know that. God bless. Outside of Austin. What does that mean? That could mean like four hours away. Whatever. I know where it is. We all know where Greenleaf is. Beautiful little town. Beautiful campus. Pines all around. You'll love it there, son. Jake had his doubts about that, but he heard himself saying, We'll see. You won't regret it, Cordell Gardner said with a grin on his rugged old face. And that ends chapter three. Now we know the backstory. We know that fucking Jake Rivers. Well, I guess I guess he got his GED and his bachelor's degree while he was in the army. Which can you do that? I guess you could do that. I guess he just worked really hard. But he's he's big. He's six five, two hundred fifty pounds. He's the best at guns and driving cars and banging milfs. He was too good at all those American pastimes, so they tried to lock him up in jail. And then they were like, you're too good. You're going to bang all the moms, so you got to go to war. And he was like, okay. And then he was the best at war, too. Yeah, Jake Rivers is a poor man's Jack Reacher. It really is, yeah. What was his actual crime? I guess street racing? Uh, cool. Okay, well, let's do some math. Let me, uh, let me consult the records here. So let's see here. Don't know a lot in this goddamn crazy world with all these liberals and their freaking ideas and shit. Definitely know that, yeah, it's time to get back to the real show. Chapter four. No pinky swearing and trigger warning, that's for damn sure. Okay, so the last chapter ended 
with Cordell Gardner promising Jake that he wouldn't regret going to college. Chapter 4. But Jake had regretted it. Going to college, that is, almost immediately. His grandfather had said he would fit right in. Nothing could have been further from the truth. His bachelor's degree was in biology. He had thought briefly he might become a veterinarian because he'd always liked dogs and had worked with, worked with them overseas. But inevitably, that would mean dealing with a lot of dying animals that he couldn't save. And he, knew, and he just didn't have the heart for that. It would take too great a toll on him. Maybe some sort of research, though. The idea of sitting in a lab all day didn't appeal to him, but there were other kinds of research. Going out into jungles and such, discovering new species, things like that. That didn't sound so bad. And objectively, Jake knew his grandfather was right about one thing. He was smart. If one field of study didn't pan out the way he wanted, he'd just do something else. With Cordell Gardner's money behind him, plus the small inheritance he had gotten from his maternal grandfather, who had owned a trucking company in New Orleans, he really didn't have to worry about making a living. Kelton College was a liberal arts school, though. There was a science department, of course, including a program that offered a master's degree in biology, but it was a small part of the school's focus, which was heavily geared toward literature, theater, music, philosophy, sociology, and especially political science but only politics of a certain stripe. Just looking at the names of some of the courses listed in the catalog had him frowning and figuratively scratching his head. Gender, culture, and U.S. national identity. Feminist critique of Christianity. Social justice and American racism. The psychological impact of male microaggression. Countering warmongering and oppression in American culture. Understanding multiphasic gender constructs. Jake had never seen such a load of useless baloney in all his life. Where were the regular courses? He flipped over to the English section. Heteropatriarchy in American literature. LGBTQIAPK tales, colon, a seminar. He had to look that one up. The abbreviation, which evidently today's college students instinctively understood, meant lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer, intersex, asexual, pan, and kink. Whatever floated anybody's boat was okay with Jake, as long as it didn't involve force, coercion, or kids. But a whole college course devoted to stories about such things? One glance into the political science section landed him on a course called the Toxic American Political Axis, Republicans, Nazis, and Fascists. Jake closed the catalog. He was grateful that he wouldn't have to mess with any of that sort of course, since he was going for his master's degree in biology. He found out different when he met his faculty advisor. Kelton College requires a diverse course load even for specialized advanced degrees, the professor said. A brass nameplate on his desk read Dr. Matumbo. <laughs> okay. Why, why is that such a... Whatever. <clears throat> the guy was as pale as anyone Jake had ever seen. A tall, balding, gawky with a receding chin. He looked like a big white bird. Jake couldn't help himself. He said, Dr. Matumbo. The man sniffed. I identify as African American. My ancestors were colonists named Montembal, Montembo, I think French, yeah, who lived for a time in French Equatorial Africa before immigrating to this country. I simply adopted a more appropriate spelling to honor the unfortunate people they oppressed and exploited. Oh. Jake said. He supposed that made perfect sense to the guy on the other end of the desk. And you teach? Microbiology. I'll probably be in some of your classes then. I look forward to it, the professor said, not sounding the least bit sincere. He pushed a printed list across the desk to Jake. At any rate, here is the suggested course for study for the degree you're pursuing. Jake picked up the list and scanned it, then said, a lot of those courses don't appear to have anything to do with biology. I mean economics, political theory, socialization. A Kelton College graduate is a well-rounded graduate. 
It sounded like a slogan and probably was, although Jake wasn't going to waste time looking for it in the college's brochure or catalog. So I have to take these to get a master's in biology? They're prerequisites for any advanced degree. Okay. Dr. Montambol, Jake just couldn't think of him as Matumbo, although he realized that was insensitive of him, clasped his skinny fingers together and said, You've already been admitted to this institution, Mr. Rivers, but if I may speak frankly, I really can't see why. No offense, but you simply don't strike me as Kelton College material, despite your academic record, which is, for the most part, mm, exemplary. Except for the part about dropping out of high school as soon as I turned 18 and joining the army, eh? Ma Montembal looked like he had just bitten into a sour crab apple, as he said, We don't have a large number of veterans among our student body. We found that a military background. The look got even more sour. It doesn't prepare a person for our rigorous curriculum and stringent standards of personal behavior. We have a very strict code of conduct and accountability here at Kelton. More strict than the army and marines? The professor opened a drawer in his desk and took out a sheaf of stapled together pages, at least seven or eight sheets thick. He placed them on the desk and pushed them over to Jake. This is our speech code. As part of our commitment to diversity, college, uh, Kelton College graduates all contain. Oh, fucking Christ. Kelton College guarantees all students a safe and inclusive learning environment, so you shouldn't use any of the words or phrases listed here. Jake frowned. I seem to remember reading something about a right to free speech. Montembal tripped a finger tapped a fingertip against the pages. Bringing up the First Amendment is listed in here. You shouldn't do that. It shuts down productive discussion. You shouldn't say anything about the Second Amendment either, especially the Second Amendment. Before Jake could respond, he took a booklet from the drawer and added it to the speech code. Our sexual guidelines. An abridged version of the Kama Sutra? Montembal. Montem Montembal. Goddamn. Montembal glared. Also, MacDoodle. Thanks for gifting subs. Those appear to be showing up. Maybe it's maybe it's unstuck now. I do think it has tracked all the all the numbers since then. <sighs> oh you. Oh you stream elements. Yeah. Jake Rivers just scored an epic dump dunk. <sighs> My mouth is going insane. An epic dunk on Mon Montembal. Alright. Sexist comments like that are also violations of the speech code. No, this sets out the proper steps that are required to be taken before any sort of sexual contact to ensure that all such contacts are consensual. No means no, eh? Exactly. So, yes means yes? No, yes also means no, because of our heteropatriarchal phallocentric culture. So, no means no, and yes means no. Jake spread his hands. They're college students, how are they going to get it on if everything means no? The professor looked exasperated and impatient. Just study the guidelines, Mr. Rivers. I'm sure it'll all become clear to you. Until it does, I would advise you to be very circumspect, circumspect in your interactions with other students. Female students. All students. Not everyone accepts the antiquated concept of binary gender, you know. Remember, L-G-G-B-D-T-T-T-I-Q-Q-A-A-P-P. That means... Jake held up a hand to stop him. That's all right. I don't need it defined. But I thought it was LGBTQIAPK. We got him. Montembal blew out, a, blew out a scoffing breath. That's outdated. This college experience is very fast-paced for one these days, Mr. Rivers. You'll have to learn to keep up. Education is all about change, hope, and change, and resistance, and social justice. Jake realized he might as well be talking to one of the brick walls of the buildings on campus. He said, I appreciate the help, Doc. Are there any more uh, guidelines I should have? Not at the moment. When you work out which courses you're going to be taking, come back here to see me and we'll go over them to make sure they fit your course of study. Jake stood up. 
Sure. Now maybe you can tell me where to find the housing department. You aren't going to live off campus? There are some decent apartments to rent in town. No, I realize I'm a little older. No, I realize I'm a little older than most students, but I want to get the full college experience. You do allow graduate students to live in the dorms. One floor of Olmsted Hall is reserved for graduate students. I'm not sure if there are any openings. I'll check into it, Jake said. He planned on keeping his relationship to Cordell Gardner quiet, but he wasn't above using it to his advantage if necessary. And the old man had it in his head that if college was... Wait. And the old man had it in his head that college was the same sort of place it had been 50 years earlier when he had wanted to attend but couldn't. So that meant Jake ought to... So that meant Jake ought to live in a dorm as he saw it. Given the amount of money his grandfather had forked over to Kelton College, Jake figured they would find a place for him. The housing office is in the administration building on the far end of Nafsinger Plaza, the professor said, on the second floor. Thanks. Jake turned to go. Mr. Rivers, are you sure you want to attend Kelton College? I ask for your own benefit. I'm not certain you're ever going to be happy here. Are you kidding? Jake grinned. I plan on loving it. And that's the end of chapter four. Oh, boy. What a tense encounter. Higher education, am I right? What a joke. They're all stupid. I'm wondering when... Surely he's got to run into his... His packaged and ready to go woman that the universe owes him pretty soon, right? <laughs> LGBTQQQBTQQQ plus IA plus divided by two. Awesome. So good. Oh shit, everybody, it's 420. 420 on the clock. Weed warning, everybody. Blah, 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 blah. It's funny. I'll never, I'll never not laugh at lol weed. To me, lol weed is in the same category as, uh, as D's nuts. As just like dumb shit. <sighs> yeah, no Bert. Um, so I'm using a solid state now, so I think Bert might be hard to recreate. Anyway, we're here with chapter five. Nobody smoke weed. That's what liberals do. Good conservatives just get drunk and beat their wives. Chapter five. Jake? I don't know who's saying this. Somebody is saying, Jake? The college experience hadn't been great so far, despite his sarcastic comment to Dr. Montem Ball. Okay, so we're still in the... He's still meeting with his college professor. Jake? I, it might take me a minute to get it back. But now he was in enough trouble to land him in the office of the campus police chief. McCraney was glaring at him. All right, never mind. Never mind. Can you take the audio from a VOD of the Burt? Probably, actually. Maybe? Huh. Yes, the white professor with an African name that the, the narrator slash main character refuses to use, by the way. Sorry, sir, Jake said. I guess I got a little distracted there. If you don't want me to... If you don't want to tell me what you're doing here, I guess it's none of my business. As long as you pay your tuition and fees and abide by the rules, you're welcome as any other student. He's just a full-on, like, shitty Brooklyn cop now. I don't know. I don't know that I'd go so far to say... Oh, Jesus Christ. I don't know that I'd go so far as to say that. I didn't vote the right way, and I'm a soldier. That's enough to make me persona non grata in a place like Kilton, Jake ventured to add. I'm a little surprised to find you working here in the middle of all these... Special little snowflakes! A sound came from a cranny that was part disgusted snort, part tolerant laugh. Here's the thing, Jake. Kelton charges an arm and a leg, and because of that, nearly all the kids who go here come from wealthy families. I mean really wealthy. Like your grandfather. Only a lot of them are even richer. And those mamas and daddas want kiddos to be safe. In fact, they insist on it. So college is willing to pay me a hefty salary to make sure they stay that way. More than twice as much I ever made as a real cop in Houston. 
I can put up with a lot of derp for that kind of money. Jake grinned. Derp? I'm surprised you know the word. What the hell does that mean? Derp? I know what it means, but it was a meme word before it meant... No, I'm sure they'll explain it. I don't know. I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Hey, I work on a college campus. I hear a lot of stuff. Of course, I'm usually three or four years behind the times anyway. That's not bad for an old guy like me. I guess. So you're letting me go? I'm releasing you on your own recognizance while I investigate the incident. That's the best I can do tonight. And I can't guarantee that the administration won't come down on you harder later on. In fact, I can almost promise they will. But they won't kick you out. Cordell's money means too much to, for that. Oish. McCraney stood up. Come by sometime tomorrow. I'll have your statement ready for you to sign by then. Between now and then, try to stay out of trouble, okay? I am a peaceable man. Yeah, Wild Bill Elliott used to say the same kind of thing before he beat the crap out of Yakima Kanut. What? Who? Google him! Now get out of here! Jake left the chief's office and went into the lobby of the campus department, which was located in an unassuming little building tucked away in a corner of the campus. Bill Elliott, Yakima Kanut. I don't want to Google it. <laughs> oh, the incident? Yeah. The incident they're referring to is that he witnessed, he witnessed a slapping, he stepped in to stop it, and then he was attacked by an Antifa gang before campus security tasered him twice. Because he's so hard-ass, one taser wouldn't do it. Okay, behind the counter stood a burly, uniformed officer in his 30s. His head was shaved, either because he thought it made him look intimidating or because he had lost most of his hair anyway and didn't want to call attention to that fact. The chief's letting you go? He asked with a scowl. That's right, Jake said. You have a problem with that, Officer Granderson? You resisted arrest. We should have held you for the Greenleaf Corps. Cops. Ah, Greenleaf Cops. How did I resist arrest? You ordered your guys to tase me as soon as I turned around toward you. You displayed weapons in an aggressive manner. The pipe and chain. I was holding them down at my sides. Looked to me like you were getting ready to attack us with them, Granderson insisted. I ordered preemptive action to protect the safety and well-being of my fellow officers. The scowl turned into an ugly grin. I bet it hurt like hell, didn't it? I have grabbed live wires before, Jake said with a shrug. No big deal. Yeah, you thought no big deal when you were laying there on the ground twitching and drooling. Jake felt anger bubbling up inside of him. But Chief McCraney had just warned him to stay out of trouble. And besides, a jack wagon like Cal Granderson wasn't worth it. A jack wagon? Get out of here, jack wagon. Did he just admit he grabbed live wires for fun? Remember, he's really smart. You have to remember that he's super smart and college is like dumb though. He's like too smart for college, kind of. But he's grabbed live wires before. Super tough, yeah. 350 pounds of American beef. Let's see here. Okay, jack wagon wasn't worth it. Jake just said, I've been released pending the results of an investigation into tonight's incident. You could have killed somebody. They had to boot you out of here. I was outnumbered at least 10 to 1. The way that mob was forming, it could have been 20 or 30 to 1 in no time. And you blame me for what happened? You assaulted two students for no reason. You resorted to violence. What about those goons in the black hoods who wanted to bust me up? Fascism should be resisted by all available means. You're a cop. Jake said, frustration making his voice rise. Those Antifa kids hate you, too. <laughs> How can you be anti-fascist? You're a cop. <sighs> yeah, the cop sounds pretty based right now, actually. So wait, they're implying that the cops are part of Antifa? 
because that's like that's a whole other that's a whole other thing. Hmm. Yep, Futter, it's true. It's true. Nothing is simple out there. Stories are fun. And, you know, we all, we all get gratification of seeing, like, the weak defended on screen. But, boy, do you have no idea what's going on with people. People are so chaotic. Just talking about the realities of actually maybe stepping in and trying to prevent abuse. Not that you shouldn't do it, but you shouldn't do it yourself. That's what you'd call the police, basically. Theoretically. Depending. You know, it's all contextual. You don't want to cop strike somebody, but if you see violence, anybody, if you see anybody hitting anyone in public, call the cops. Ugh. Anyway, I'm a nice little stretch here. I'm just saying, like, if you want to help. Mm. Hey, Strider, you just got here? Well, okay. Jake Rivers is being released from the police station after getting tased because he was jumped by an Antifa gang at college. That's where we're at. And he's walking out of the police station right now. I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's see. Your cop, da, 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 da. Oh my God, all right. Those Antifa kids hate you too. We remember. Authority figures or not, some of us are on the right side of history, Granderson said with a sneer. The chief's door, the chief's door opened. Jake, you're still here. Get back to the dorm. Don't you have studying to do? Jake thought about the book he had tossed aside to go to the aid of the young woman named Annie. That had been a mistake, all right. He should have stuck with the scholastic, er, socialistic drivel. He held up his hands and said, I'm going, I'm going. Do I need to have an officer escort you back to Olmstead Hall? No, I'll be alright. I'm more worried about anybody you happen to run into. No trouble, I swear, Jake said. McCraney didn't look convinced, but he didn't say anything as Jake left the building, and neither did Granders. Bah. And neither did Granderson. The night was still warm and pleasant as Jake walked along concrete paths under trees past stately old brick buildings instead of the chrome and glass monstrosities found in so many other places. He could almost believe he had been transported back in time to a college the way it used to be. Or the way it was in movies, anyway. He almost expected to run into some blonde ingenue. Instead, when he was in a particularly dark, shadow-filled stretch of sidewalk, two shapes stepped out in front of him and brought him to an abrupt stop. Some faint sounds from behind him told him the jaws of the trap had just closed on that side as well. Hello, fellas, Jake said. Are you the campus patrol coming to see that I get back to my dorm safely? A muffled voice, disguised even more by whispering, said, Shut up. Got the hoods on, don't you? I don't get it. If you think you're standing up for what's right, why not show your faces? Why not take credit for being on the right side of history? Give it. Earlier, that was a show for the cell phones. The, spokespers the spokesman rasped. Those videos are already up on social media and have tens of thousands of views. The big bad alt-right warrior brought down by the people. Brought down by a bunch of volts of electricity, you mean. The hooded figure ignored the comment and went on. This is for keeps now. We don't want your kind here, Nazi. And if that means putting you in the hospital to make you leave, we'll do it. I'm not a Nazi or a fascist. Jake snapped. Go buy a damn dictionary. The Nazis were socialists. Your side. A convenient lie. Study some history, you damn fool. Hey, Steph. Did you know the Nazis were actually socialists? Did you know that? Did you know that? Did you know that? Did you know that? Did you, did you know that? 
Did you? Stop. Not a lot of people know that. You got to drop it on people. Oh, sorry. I think I ate the last Cheeto bag. Yeah, he's he's like this is in the middle of him getting mugged, by the way, by by feral liberals <laughs> again, the third time. <laughs> the book does admit that he is a rootin' tootin' rude dude. He he drives cars fast, he shoots guns good, and he fucks moms. He, no, I, well, it's a form of love. I can't believe the low country lo-fi wasn't on that entire time. Oh, yeah. Oh, you, that's right. You make no, no, it's fine. Doom, doom still fits, sort of. This is how, this is how conservatives see the world. <laughs> yeah. Like Just one gun poking directly out of your, your chest. This is what the Bible described. Okay, goddamn. All right. So he's having a philosophical debate with the dude who's here to, to ex I guess, kick him out of college or something. Kick the filthy army guy out of college for being a conservative. Uh, okay. Okay, so Jake Rivers has just informed his muggers that the Nazi party were socialists. Study some history, you damn fool. Or go on spouting your precious narrative, I don't care. Just get out of my way. Not this time. The man chuckled under the hood. You see, we're not kids playing at being revolutionaries. That was true, Jake realized suddenly. He couldn't make out many details in the poor light, but there was something fundamentally different in the way these guys stood and moved. Something professional. Most members of the various Antifa groups were really kids. Spoiled, brainwashed, vicious little monsters. But still kids. Jake had read enough about the movement, though, to have come across... Hmm, wait, what? Oh, that movement. The Antifa movement. Jake had read enough about the movement, though, to have come across rumors that within the groups, terrorist cells, if somebody wanted to call them what they really were, Individuals had been planted by the liberal billionaires who funded such madness. Men and women with military, paramilitary, and mercenary backgrounds who had done things that would make the kids cry and wet themselves just to think about. They were there to keep the useful idiots in line, to make sure they showed up where they were supposed to and rioted right on cue, and also to take care of any actual dirty business that came up. Like getting rid of a former army ranger, blah. like getting rid of a former army ranger who, for some reason, they considered more of a threat than he really was. Hell, Jake thought, all he wanted was to be left alone. If they would do that, he would be alternately disgusted and amused by the kids' antics, but would largely ignore them as long as they ignored him. But that wasn't to be. These guys were actual threats, and the odds were four to one. Jake was willing to bet they were armed, possibly with pipes. Maybe they would kill it. Maybe they wouldn't kill him. But they would beat him damn close to the point of death. They would try anyway. I'm a peaceable man, he said again under his breath, more to himself than his enemies. What was that? I said, I'm a peaceable man. Didn't mean anything... Just, what? Another, it's just a sentence fragment. Didn't mean anything to the hooded figures. Period. After he said he's a peaceable man. Didn't mean anything to the hooded figures. The spokesman snapped. Get him! And that ends chapter five. <sighs> back into the action. Could not even walk back to his dormitories before... Antifa terrorists have waylaid him yet again. He's trying to live in peace. Has the world gone mad? Why can't the, the grandson of a billionaire 
who had to serve no prison time for speeding and was a super rad army man. Why can't he just walk through life like the rest of us? It's Shenmue. It's literally Shenmue. It's kind of Shenmue. Except Ryo is not as, uh, not as smug as Jake Rivers. I don't think Ryo has the capacity for smugness. Ugh, God. Just in time to reset the clock to 439. Yeah, I'll go ahead and do that. Well, I'm afraid to do that while sub alerts are still rolling. We'll get there before, before it gets to 20. Don't worry about that. Jake's bad at games. Thanks for gifting a sub. Jake Rivers is bad at games. I'm going to guess yes. Jake Rivers is probably bad at games. He probably thinks he's good at games, but he's probably not. Chapter 6. The men behind him closed in first. Yes. Jake Rivers has just been waylaid by professionally trained terrorist cell Antifa. The men behind him closed in first. Jake had to turn to meet their attack, which cost him a fraction of a second. But he was fast enough to overcome that and darted aside from the pipe that streaked down toward his head with deadly force. Oh shit, crab foam. Thank you for the 19 subs. Thank you very much. That's an intense amount. That is extreme crab power. Thank you. More pipes. Yeah, this is almost like a, it's like Final Fight or Streets of Rage or something. Just thugs with pipes. It almost got his shoulder, which could have been disastrous, but it barely missed and raked down the side of his upper right arm instead. The hooded men hadn't been lurking here in the shadows waiting for him just so they could beat him up. They meant to kill him, just because he hadn't eagerly swallowed and regurgitated their line of political bull. Wrong think was a capital offense in their minds. Well, despite his promise to Frank McCraney, Jake was in no mood right now to pull any punches himself. Uh, Private Futterwhacking, thank you for gifting two subs. The man who just tried to crack his skull open was off balance because the blow had missed. As he stumbled forward a little, Jake kicked him in the right kneecap and heard the bone pop. The man screeched in pain under the hood. Jake gave him a hard, two-handed shove in the chest and sent him flying back into his partner. In a continuation of the same move, Jake launched himself off the sidewalk, hit the grass, somersaulted over, and came up on his feet again. Hoo -hoo -ah, hoo -ah, did a little jump and roll. Hoo -ah. That took him out of easy reach of the two who had been in front of him, including the spokesman for the attackers. They were still close, though, and they came at him fast, veering apart to come at him from different angles. Jake could tell by the way they moved that they had some training, maybe military, maybe police academy, or else their group, funded by liberal money, had paid someone with experience to teach them a few things. Jake went down again, used a leg sweep to take out one man's legs out from under him. <laughs> take one man's legs out from under him and rolled to avoid the pipe wielded by the other one. He came up, blocked an attempted backhand with his right forearm and hammered his left fist into the hooded face. The guy's head rocked back. Jake stepped in, slid his right arm under the man's right arm, got his left arm on the elbow and broke it with a hard pinching twist. The man said, ha ha, and dropped the pipe. It thudded to the ground at Jake's feet. He dived again and snatched up the fallen pipe as he rolled over. Hoo -ha, hoo. <laughs> he brought it up just in time to block another swipe. K ting. The pipes clang together loudly. Ting, 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 ting. They're fucking like lightsaber fighting with pipes. <laughs> oh, man. This is basically describing a Yakuza fight now. Would that be enough to make somebody call the campus cops and report it? Jake didn't know, and he didn't want to wind up in McCraney's office yet again tonight, so he figured it would be best to wrap this up click quickly. Ugh. The two men he still faced might have something to say about that, however. Broken kneecap and broken elbow were out of the fight, but their comrades swarmed Jake as he scrambled to his feet, slashing with the pipes they held. He was forced to give ground, as for a moment it was all he could do to block the blows aimed at him. The pipes rang together like an anvil chorus. 
one of the blows got through and slammed against Jake's side. Pain exploded through him. He didn't think it broke a rib, but it hurt like hell, that was for sure, and made him stumble. Both attackers surged forward to seize this momentary advantage. Jake's back bumped up against something, stopping him. One of the trees in Nafziger Plaza, he realized. In a way, he was grateful for that. It protected his back, so one of the hooded men couldn't circle and try to come at him from that direction. It meant that this was where he would make his stand. His lips drew back from his teeth in a grimace. Come on, you sons of bitches, he said. They redoubled their attack, but that frenzied effort proved to be a mistake. As much as anything else, they got in each other's way, and during the split second they were trying to recover from that awkwardness, Jake sensed as much mm, Jake sensed as much as saw an opening and lashed out with a pipe in his hand. It landed on a man's right shoulder and brought a cry of pain. Hold on a second. The country lo-fi has stopped. So I have to I have to start it up again. Hope there's no vocals in this. Play badass fight music? I should. I don't know what that would be for I guess it would just be the Doom soundtrack now. Let's see here. Let's see here. The trees. Where are we going? What do we got here? Come on, you sons of bitches. Yeah. Landed on the man's right shoulder. Brought a cry of pain. Oh, Streets of Rage. Not country enough, is it? Streets of Rage soundtrack is, is pretty blessed. Yeah. Let's go with that, though. Can't beat that, can you? Yeah, we'll just start with one. I know it doesn't get hot until two, but... It's hot enough. All right. Jake flicked the pipe up and to the right in short, short, sharp backhand that traveled only a few inches but packed enough force to break the man's jaw. Jake heard bone crunch under the impact. It was a satisfying sound. The injured man sagged. Jake kicked his feet out from under him. The man toppled over on his companion just as Jake intended. The man shoved broken jaw away and started to retreat. In fact, the sudden prospect of an even fight didn't seem to appeal to him at all. He turned and ran. Jake could have let him go, but that thought never occurred to him. He took off after the guy. They had surrounded him like jackals easy to pull down a helpless victim and feast. But not all victims were helpless, and they weren't even victims. The fleeing man hadn't reached the sidewalk when Jake left his feet in a flying tackle from behind his quarry. He crashed into the man and brought him down. Both of them landed hard. The jolt sent fresh explosions of pain from Jake's battered side through the rest of his body. The man had tried to escape, but that didn't mean all the fight had gone out of him. He brought an elbow back and around and slammed it against Jake's jaw. That gave him enough wiggle room to squirm free. When he had a little distance between them, he aimed a kick at Jake's face. Jake saw it coming and grabbed the man's foot, stopping the kick before it could land. He gave the foot a hard wrench that forced the man to roll over. Jake tried to pounce on the man's back. If he could get the guy in a sleeper hold, this fight would be over in a hurry. The man kept moving, though, and avoided Jake's dive. This time the kick he positioned out landed on Jake's upper left arm and twisted him around. That arm went numb for a moment and hung uselessly from his shoulder, so he couldn't use it to block the blow when the man clubbed both hands together and swung them with stunning force at Jake's head. He's really doing like a William Shatner double fist chop. Ha! That's not a thing. He's a professional. He moves like a pro. The two-handed blow caught him above the left ear and stretched him out. It was a good thing his skull was so thick. 
he thought vaguely as he tried to recover. Before he could do so, the man landed on him and dug a knee into his belly. That didn't do any damage to the slabs of muscle there, but it did force the air from Jake's lungs and disorient him a little more. Slabs. <laughs> yeah, it was a real judo chop. Okay, I think the... I think the meters have calmed down a smidgen. I can update some stuff. Thank you all so much again for the... Explosion of generosity. Update everything. Definitely wanted to do that before we hit 420 on the, the timer again. Just just for anyone observing. Observing this holiday. Okay, we just heard about his slabs. Um Thick skull and slabs of muscle. Okay. He got his right hand up, planted it on the man's face. The hand slid because of the hood. Jake dug his fingers into it and ripped upward. The hood came off. The shadows in the plaza were so thick, Jake still couldn't see his enemy's face. But he could feel the guy's hot breath panting on him now. He threw the hood aside, grabbed the man's hair at the back of his head, and jackknifed his body in the middle so he could headbutt the guy in the face. Cartilage crunched and blood spurted as the man's nose flattened under the impact. That stunned him long enough for Jake to grab his shoulders and fling him aside. Both of Jake's arms were working well enough now that he was able to grab the man's right leg and lever it up until something gave a sharp snap. The man let out a thin shriek of agony that Jake choked off with a hand around his throat. Jake hovered over him and increased the pressure. The man was in too much pain from his broken or dislocated hip to fight back anymore, but the lack of air and the desperate need to breathe made him spasm ineffectively. I could kill you right now, you know that. I could kill you right now, you know that, don't you? Jake said in a hoarse half whisper. All it would take to crush your windpipe is a little more pressure. Then I could walk away and you'd lay there and suffocate. And there wouldn't be a damn thing you could do to stop it. Instead of doing that, Jake eased up a little. The man gasped in some air. Then used it to rasp. Fascist! Jake squeezed again. Are you really that stupid? You think a real fascist, a real Nazi would let you live right now? I've been listening to you idiots for years now. Yammering about how any politician you don't like is a literally Hitler. When all along, it's been your side that's been acting like the brown shirts and going after anyone who doesn't agree with you. Free speech. But it's only free if it's speech you approve of. Speech that fits your precious narrative. Anything else that gets sh God damn it, hold on. Anything else gets shut down with violence if need be. Hell, you like the violence. Makes you feel big and powerful. Punching Nazis feels great. Only you're the Nazis. <laughs> Jake lifted the guy's head by the throat and banged it against the ground. Holy crap. He's not done. Are you listening to me? Damn it. You got me so mad I'm the one who's yammering now. So just listen to this. If the other side was as bad as you believe it is, if we wanted death camps, then by God, we'd have death camps by now. But we're still willing to live and let live if you'll just let us. If you won't, well, do you want a civil war? Because that's how you get a civil war. And it won't be nearly as much fun as you think it will be. To one dude on the ground. <sighs> Leave Jake Rivers alone. Or you're gonna get a war you never bargained for. This is so sick. All right, hold on. The guy wasn't struggling anymore. Jake didn't know whether he'd heard all of that. He was a little disgusted with himself for running off at the mouth that way, but his side hurt, and he was frustrated and angered by the sheer stupidity and cognitive dissonance of almost everything he had seen and heard since coming to Kelton College. Then, he'd, then he hoped he hadn't killed the guy. He wouldn't lose any sleep over it, 
The four hooded men had been trying to kill him after all, and he felt justified in using deadly force against them in return. But if this one or any of the others were dead, it could sure as hell turn out to be a hassle. He let go of the man's neck and was relieved to hear the rough breaths in his throat. Jake stood up and looked around. The plaza remained dark and quiet. The fight hadn't been loud enough to make anybody call the cops. That was good, because Jake didn't think he could stomach another encounter with Cal Granderson tonight. He went to the other three men who were sprawled here and there and bent over to yank the hoods off their heads too. They were all breathing. A couple had passed out, but one was still conscious and whimpering in pain. Don't, don't hurt me, he begged. Don't try to bully someone who's willing and able to fight back, Jake told him. Better yet, don't bully anybody. People have a right to believe whatever they want to believe. S social j justice is bull. There's just justice. And sometimes it's a bitch, just like karma. Oh, there's just justice. Okay. Take that again. Social justice is bull. There's just justice. And sometimes it's a bitch, just like karma. <laughs> so good. Jake walked off and left the man there sobbing. <laughs> he probably peed his pants too. The book doesn't say that, but I bet he, I bet he peed his pants. He took deep breaths as he walked along the sidewalk in front of the library. The place was closed by now, although some lights were still lit over its long, columned porch. Jake took inventory of his condition. The twinges he felt as he inhaled told him he might have bruised ribs. He definitely had bruised muscles. But he didn't believe anything was broken. He worked his shoulders, sore, but good to go there too. The damage he had taken in the fight was minimal. He decided. That thought was running through his mind when someone stepped out from behind one of the columns on the library porch and said, I saw what you did back there. But who and how and why is this person? We'll have to wait to see because that is the end of chapter six. Chapter seven is next. Shenmue! Yeah. Jake dug too deep and too hard. And then he got jumped by organized an organized paramilitary terrorist cell. But I'm pretty sure a hot babe saw him beat up all those dudes and got turned on by it. You know how to handle yourself. Yeah, it's, it's gotta be a woman. This has gotta be the, like, the pert redhead who doesn't take sass from nobody but really just wants to be pumped full of babies and cook and clean for the rest of her life. Can't wait. Uh, female number one. Yeah, that's right. The the prime position of a conservative a conservative woman is female number one. Ooh, Comba Christ, Grendel, and a Varden Sphere. I know Comba Christ from the DMC soundtrack. 420 is about to hit. Whoa. -oh. Good time to get up and take a little stretch break. Oh no, I forgot to record this section. Damn it, I hate it when that happens. I'm gonna take a little note here. You ready to be triggered? Watch out, liberal snowflake. Here comes Jake Rivers, and he's headed up to here. So last chapter, ironically, it seems that even Jake Rivers got triggered after getting jumped three times in a row by uh, liberal, insane liberal terrorists. Uh, but after defending America and freedom and the Second Amendment from the liberal jack, jack wagons, uh, he's limping away. He does a little self-evaluation, a little, a little self, self pat down, finds out that he's not really that injured because he's awesome and has slab like abs and out of the shadows came an appreciative voice saying, nice moves, tiger. Chapter seven, Jake stopped short. Instantly, he took in several details about the person who had just spoken to him enough that he was reasonably sure he wasn't about to be under attack again. Although he couldn't be certain about that, he remain he reminded himself. Wait. Oh. Although he couldn't be certain about that, he reminded himself. After all, women could be dangerous too. Even women as attractive as this one. Maybe especially women as attractive as this one. The guy might stand there thinking about how hot she was and never realize she was about to kill him. But in this case, she didn't make any threatening moves. 
She just stood there with her hands in the hip pockets of the jeans she wore and looked at him. It was a casual stance, but it might have been calculated to make her breasts stand out a little more prominently against the shirt she wore. If that was the case, it worked. The hair that tumbled around her shoulders shone reddish gold in the light. Jake couldn't see her eyes, but he was willing to bet that they were brown. A reach, a deep, rich brown. He didn't need to be thinking about that. Other things were more important. Are you going to take out your phone and call the cops? He asked. Would you try to stop me if I did? She asked. He shook his head. That would be entirely up to you. I'd like to point out, though, that I'm the one who was attacked, and there were four of them against one of me. If that's not self-defense. The same situation as earlier this evening, right? She interrupted him. When you allegedly assaulted those two students and then got into a fight with the Antifa patrol? Patrol? Jake repeated scornfully. That's what they say they're doing, patrolling the campus for signs of extremist right-wing aggression and oppression. Jake snorted. They must not stay very busy. How many people on this campus aren't progressive idiots? A dozen? Two dozen? I'd say we're all outnumbered. He paused. And I apologize if you're a progressive idiot. You're an obnoxious young man, aren't you? In addition to being a violent one. I speak my mind too bluntly sometimes, I suppose. Free speech, Jake added dryly. As for the violence, I'm as peaceful as a kitten as long as nobody backs me into a corner. But then you fight to win, no matter what it takes. Jake just shrugged. Never saw any point in being any other way. For a long moment, she regarded him in silence. <laughs> this kitten's got claws. <laughs> uh. Standing at the edge of the porch with six broad steps between her and Jake on the sidewalk. Then she said, I'm not going to call the campus police. Appreciate that. You're already liable to be in enough trouble from the earlier altercation, although it wasn't your fault. You admit that? I know those two, Craig and Annie, and their relationship is fraught with drama, as the literature yeah, as the literature professors might say. They fight and break up and get back together almost daily. The real problem is Craig is actually abusive, and Annie is a textbook example of an enabler. I've talked to her and tried to get her to see that, but it hasn't done any good. A sad smile touched her lips. The students consider themselves so progressive and forward-thinking and woke. But a lot of the times, they're just like young people have always been, making foolish choices about whose pants they're going to get into. <laughs> you sound awfully world-weary and cynical for somebody who's pretty young herself. I'm older than you, the woman said. Jake shrugged. By six or seven years, maybe. I'm Jake Rivers, by the way. I know who you are. You're not exactly the run-of-the-mill Kelton College student. There are rumors among the faculty that you must be related to some big donor, but nobody seems to know exactly who it is. Or if they do, they're keeping it to themselves. You're a professor? Criminal justice, Dr. Natalie Burke. <laughs> I'd say that you don't look like a criminal justice professor. But that would be sexist, exclusionary, patriarchal, and oppressive? She said sternly. Haven't you read the speech guide? I looked at it. Jake hedged. I was more interested in the sexual conduct guidelines. <laughs> Smooth, Jake. Here comes the swoop. Uh. Yes, well, we don't have to worry about that. And even you bringing that up is harassment, you know. Jake held up both his hands, palms out. I surrender, doctor. What well, can I say? I'm an evil, cis-normative heterosexual. I can't help myself. He smiled. Say, does that mean I'm mentally ill? That cuts me some slack. I'm disadvantaged, depressed minority on this campus for damn sure. Dr. Burke laughed. She looked a little ashamed of herself for doing so, but she couldn't seem to help it. Ah, she makes him laugh. Or he makes her laugh, whatever. God damn it. 
Yeah, it's just two people shooting the shit. They both agree. All this is dumb. He's just a man. Conservatives flirt like Klingons. <laughs> A lot of screaming and hissing and then a knife fight. Oh, boy. Okay. Dr. Burke laughed. Yes. She seemed ashamed but couldn't help it. She slipped her phone from one of the hip pockets of her jeans. Oh, I'm terrible. I should have already gotten help for those poor young men you attacked. That way, they're, That's the way they're going to spin it, you know. They'll tell anyone who will listen that it was all your fault. My word against theirs, Jake said, assuming no one comes forward to back up their story. She held up the phone. What about video evidence? It'll just show for sure that I was defending myself, assuming it actually exists. It doesn't, Dr. Burke admitted, and I was the last one out of the library tonight and had other things on my mind, so I didn't notice exactly what happened. All I can testify to is that I found those injured men in the plaza and called 911. And that's what I'm going to do. Now. Good night, Doctor. Jake said. Good night, Mr. Reeves. Mr. Rivers, whatever. Good night, Mr. Rivers. He walked a few more yards to another sidewalk that cut across the plaza to Olmstead Hall. When he glanced back, Dr. Natalie Burke wasn't in sight. The trees must be hiding her, as the porch columns had earlier. He was a little confused. It had seemed at times as if the woman was actually flirting with him. If that was true, it was one hell of an odd time and a place for her to be doing that. At the same time, she had been right about one thing. Despite everything else swirling around them, political tomfoolery and the like, people still had universal emotions and were driven by them at all times. And she had said that she taught in the criminal justice department, he recalled. Maybe she wasn't quite as caught up in the so-called progressive movement as some. Then, remembering how he had read where some criminal justice experts always blame society for creating the predators or the victims for being preyed upon, and he wasn't so sure again. The whole encounter had him baffled. Maybe she would throw him under the bus, maybe she wouldn't, but either way... There was nothing he could do about it now. He used his key card on the front door of Olmstead Hall and went inside without encountering anyone else. It was late enough that the lobby was deserted and nobody was behind the desk. At this time of night, everybody was studying, sleeping, killing time on the internet, or having sex. Following the proper guidelines, of course. Jake went up to the second floor. Only a few hours had passed since he heard the frightened cry through the open window and went out into the night, but it seemed much longer to him. He pulled his t-shirt over his head, tossed it on the bed, and went into the bathroom. The mirror revealed large bruises on his side, shoulders, and arms. He looked like he'd been through a 15-round fight. Getting whacked with lead pipes would do that. He went back over to the desk and picked up the book he was supposed to read for his economics class. After everything that had happened, forcing himself to concentrate on it wasn't easy, but he gave it a shot. After a few minutes of trying to digest the turgid academic writing that had the evils of capitalism as its central thesis, he was almost wishing he was getting hit by lead pipes again. It might not hurt his brain as much. Me, 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 me. And that's the end of chapter seven. What a night for Jake Rivers. Am I right? World gone mad. An honest, hard-working army ranger like Jake Rivers getting jumped by Antifa thugs. But luckily, he's finally discovered his red-haired woman who just likes the way he does things, even though he <laughs> bangs milfs and wrecks cars. These are pretty short chapters, aren't they? I didn't really scout. Uh, I didn't really scout how long the chapters were. Let's see here. It's a 378-page uh, book, and there are 44 chapters. Hmm. So that's like a little under 10 pages. Like, maybe 7 pages? Something like that? 6, 7? Oh my gosh. What a journey. 
What a journey. Uh, let's see here. I'll start. I'll start throwing in bonus chapters. Maybe not every other, but I'll figure it out. Well, well, since there's like twenty total extensions, we'll do a bonus chapter at ten and fifteen, which I don't think we're at yet. That would be the ending time at two a.m., which would be a few more. Ah, uh, all right. Uh, I'm going to take a short break to order some food now that my mouth is like, it's basically back to normal. Ow. Okay. I feel it when I open it, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to milk that for a little more, uh, stream sympathy. Cause I did get my face drilled open this morning, but, uh, I'm going to order some food. What am I going to order? I think I'm going to go with Vietnamese food. That's my, like, that's my subathon stream staple because I can get a coffee and that like amps me up. Gives me that stream power. I don't know if I'm gonna get pho. That's a little messy. Usually I get like a broken rice dish. It's like grilled meat, some rice and vegetables. I'm just grooving to this music thinking about it. Okay. Uh, quick break. What happened to my mouth? I had a filling crack. How about that? All right, I'll be right back. See you, see you in a bit. Hey everybody. All buttons hit. Let's get back into it. Chapter eight. A bit loud. Hold on. Perfect. All right. Chapter eight. The confrontation between Jake and the Atifa patrol was big news for a couple of days. It was all over the internet and the cable news channels and the various cell phone videos shot by people. Wait and the various cell phone videos shot by people in the almost mob got millions of views in total, all on the different social media platforms. In almost all the news stories, Jake was referred to as alt-right, far-right wing, extremist, white supremacist, Nazi, or accused of being a member of the KKK, even though the trouble had no racial component whatsoever. Oh no, it's ads! Oh no! Okay, hold on. <sighs> not that it ever really gets cold in California, but I wash my hands with tap water. That's like the pipe is all the way at the other end of the house. So it's always just like really chill water. So it just, it freezes up my fingertips. And then I come back out here to cool air. Yeah. SK it's a, uh, if I were smart, I would have ran ads when I got up to use the restroom. That's on me. Really? I just don't hit the button. Uh, it would, what doesn't make sense to me is I could probably like base my restroom breaks around when the ads run, but I just haven't gotten into that habit yet. Uh, yeah, just another liberal billionaire trying to suppress Jake with his ads. I would, I would express my, uh, my gratitude that people are willing to sit through ads, but they're in ads and they wouldn't, wouldn't hear it. Almost done though. Three seconds. All right, welcome back, everybody. That music sting was actually pretty well timed. Excuse me. Just want to say thank you for sitting through the ads, if you had to sit through the ads. Uh, all right. In all the news stories, in almost all the news stories about the uh, the rumble in, on the college, in the college, Jake was referred to as alt-right, uh, alt far-right wing, extremist, white supremacist, Nazi, or even accused of being a member of the KKK, even though the trouble had no racial component whatsoever. The fight with fists, pipes, and chains was hysterically headlined as a mass shooting by one of the Boston papers. The New York Times decried the white right-wing brutality while sneeringly implying that such was to be expected because, after all, Kelton was in Texas, and everybody knew what sort of presidential candidates those Texans vote for. With all of that going on, it was no surprise that reporters were waiting for Jake as soon as he stepped out the front door of Olmstead Hall one morning. He was big enough that he could shoulder his way through the crowd without having to stop and say anything. He was extremely careful how he did it, though. The tiniest action that could be construed as the least bit aggressive would be portrayed as the violent attack of an alt-right lunatic against a free press. 
But there wasn't a single word about the four men Jake had left scattered around Nafzinger Plaza in various states of injury, at least not that he saw or heard. Maybe the Kelton College administration had hushed up that incident for some reason that was beyond Jake at the moment. It was, as it was, he had more than enough unwanted attention. It made it difficult for him to get to class, and once he was there, he had trouble concentrating because the other students, and usually the professors were, as well, were staring at him with a mixture of fascination and fear. He was like some exotic zoo animal, he thought. They lived in such a philosophical and political bubble that they couldn't even begin to comprehend how someone could fail to share their views on everything. And that exotic animal comparison was apt in another way, because they all seemed to be worried that he would attack and try to rip out their throats for no reason, with no warning. The 24-hour news cycle's insatiable thirst for fresh content meant that some new outrageous story would be along soon. And so it was in this case, and three celebrity sexual harassers, two corrupt congressmen, both Democrats, although little mention of that was made, and a transsexual beauty queen of color later, no one cared about that right-wing barbarian Jake Rivers anymore. Jake was glad of that. Then he received an email telling him to be at President Andrew Pelletier's office for an appointment at 10 o'clock the next morning. The email further advised him that he could be accompanied by legal counsel if he so chose. Jake did not choose to do so. Whatever boom they wanted to lower on him, he didn't much care. If they kicked him out, at least he could tell his grandfather that that he'd tried to fit in and get the college experience the old man wanted him to. And Patelier and the rest of the administration could deal with whatever fallout that brought from Cordell Gardner. Okay, I wanted to make sure the music was still going. God, Streets of Rage soundtrack, so good. That's what Jake told himself anyway as he walked toward the administration building the next morning. Deep down, though, he bristled at the thought he was going to be punished for something that wasn't his fault. Nobody ever said the world was fair, though, he reminded himself. There were no reporters clamoring around this morning, all of them having moved on to some other stories, so he noticed when somebody stepped up beside him, hurrying to keep up with his long-legged strides. You look different this morning, Dr. Natalie Burke said. Why, Jake said, because I'm wearing a suit. You look like a professional wrestler pretending to be a businessman before a match. Babyface or heel? Oh, you are definitely a babyface, Mr. Rivers. That made him laugh. Ha 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 ha. I wouldn't have pecked you. God. I wouldn't have pecked you as the sort to watch wrestling. My dad loved it. I watched it with him. It's silly, but entertaining. At its best, almost existential. Yeah, I can see how big, sweaty, oiled-up guys throwing each other around is existential. You look different, too, by the way. Because I'm wearing a dress? I guess that's it. A meeting of the faculty in my department... Yeah. A meeting of the faculty in my department with the department chairman this morning. We have to at least pretend to take it seriously. Am I allowed to say you look nice? Jake asked. Or is that a microaggression? Coming from someone as big as you, I'm not sure a microaggression is possible, but I'll allow it. Why are you dressed up? I'm getting called on the carpet in the president's office. He said. I figure they're going to kick me out. Really? She added quickly. I didn't say anything about what happened the other night, I swear. Jake slowed to stop outside the rear entrance to the administration building. The side that faced Nafzinger Plaza was actually the back of the building, which fronted on the next street over. He frowned and asked Dr. Burke, Have you heard anything about those four guys? Anything at all? The ones who jumped you on your way back to the dorm? She shook her head. No, not a thing. All of them should have spent at least one night in the hospital. (laughs) I think a couple of them would still be there, maybe more than that. Why didn't the press make a big deal out of it? Because the school wants it kept quiet for some reason. There's a question mark at the end of that. I thought it was going to be a period, so I had to try to make it a question. Didn't really work out, but whatever. That's the only thing that makes sense, but why would they do that? Liberals never hush anything. <laughs> Liberals never hush up anything that might make a conservative look bad. And everything in life breaks down into terms of liberals and conservatives, you know. 
she said. That's right, now it's nice forward-thinking progressives and evil extremist fascists. Someone has to be forward-thinking. If everyone thought backwards, the world wouldn't be a very good place. One person's forward is another person's backward. She smiled. That's almost perceptive. I mean, look at Antifa. I see jackboots and goose-stepping. Dr. Burke glanced up at the clock set into the administration building tower. Ugh. Just like, oh no, I got a meeting, that's fine. <laughs> you don't have to keep talking. <sighs> and I see that I have to hurry or I'll be late for that meeting. It was good talking with you again, Mr. Rivers. If you're still here next semester, maybe you should consider signing up for my course. There might be a career for you in criminal justice. Yeah, I'll think about it, he promised. He stood there and waited while she walked on into the building for no other reason than he wanted to watch her walk away in that dress. He couldn't get in trouble for just thinking about violating the guidelines. He stared at her ass as she walked away, and she liked it. I like how the book, like even the book understands you can't say certain things out loud. So it does that shitty thing where it implies it. But it's like, it's no, it's not bad because she didn't say that. Like, he didn't actually just stare at her ass, right? Even though he totally stared at her ass the whole time. But no, he's just appreciating her form as she walks away in a dress. Very respectful. Who needs consent, right? <laughs> it's doom all over again. It really is. It's just kind of that fundamental. <sighs> Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how Jake Rivers gets down, Pop-Tart. Let's see here. Oh, boy. So, yeah, she bailed out. Uh, actually, oh, wait, no, hold on. So he was telling himself there's no way he could get in trouble for thinking about violating the guidelines. Actually, he probably could, he amended. What were they going to do to him because of it? Kick him out? He figured he was gone anyway. Yeah, OJ, that's exactly what I was thinking. Jake Rivers is 100% a missionary-only guy. Lights off. Maybe if he's had like three beers, it's doggy style. He went into the building and along the main hall to the suite of offices where the president's and vice president's offices were located. The secretary behind the desk in the reception office gave him one of those half fascinated, half scared looks and said, uh, I was told you should go right in, Mr. Rivers. Jake smiled and said, I didn't even tell you who I am. Guess that's not really necessary these days, is it? She just smiled weakly back at him and didn't say anything, just pointed along a short carpeted hallway toward the door at the far end. Jake opened the door without knocking and went in. The office was fairly large and comfortably furnished, but not ostentatious. Several photographs on the wall to Jake's left were of the man who got his feet or er, were of the man who got to his feet behind the desk. And then he was shaking hands with different Democrat politicians. None of them white and or male. With which the man behind the desk was, other than the white hair, he bore a faint resemblance to the young Abraham Lincoln pre-beard. Jake would have bet that Andrew Pelletier enjoyed that resemblance and even cultivated it. That's rad. How cool is that? He looks like Abraham Lincoln. Can't wait for Jake Rivers to punch him in his stupid dumb face. Pre-beard Lincoln, yeah, right? Oh, God. Mr. Rivers, he said in the smooth, deep tones of an actor playing a college president. Come in and close the door. Jake glanced around as he eased the door shut behind him. The two of them were alone in the office. He said, I thought you'd have a couple of vice... Oh, wait, no. He, being Jake, I guess, said, I thought you'd have a couple of vice presidents in the college's legal team here. Pelletier shook his head. No, I just want to have a talk with you, man to man. Jake felt a stirring of concern inside. Maybe he had underestimated this man. 
Maybe Pelletier was more dangerous than he had thought. That ends chapter 8. However, the last extension was a bonus extension, so we got another chapter. Oh yes, you've done it. Another chapter! Jake is going to make out with the college president. B -b 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 bonus Wait, hold on. <laughs> That's right. A whole bonus chapter. Lucky day. Times, good times are here again. Chapter 9. As of right now, there are 17 lawsuits pending against Kel Kelton College as a result of the incident three days ago, Pelletier said when both of them had sat down. And I'm told that within the next few days, at least that many will be filed against you personally, Mr. Rivers. I didn't do anything wrong, Jake said. I guess I'll just have to take my chances in court. Pelletier smiled, but it wasn't a friendly or pleasant expression. You have the funds to defend yourself against such a legal barrage? Well, no, I don't suppose I do. So you're counting on your grandfather to help you? Jake didn't say anything. He didn't want to get the old man mixed up in this, but that might be unavoidable. We're going to settle the lawsuits, Pelletier went on after a moment. The college's lawyers assure me that this will cost less in the long run than fighting them. His lip curled in an expression of distaste. Besides, to be honest, I don't have the stomach to defend the actions of a person like you, Mr. Rivers. Jake leaned forward and frowned. A person like me? He repeated. What do you mean by that, sir? He figured he already knew the answer, but he thought he might as well go ahead and make Pelletier say it. I find your attitude and actions repellent and reprehensible, young man. Kelton College is supposed to be a haven of learning for all students, regardless of ethnicity, nat national origin, gender, lifestyle, or philosophy. We value diversity and a, welcome <laughs> and a welcoming inclusivity. This entire campus is a safe space, if you will. And then you... <laughs> Pelletier looked like he wanted to spit. You come in here with your far-right, nationalistic, patriarchal, sexist, bigoted, supremacist leanings and make our entire student body and faculty extremely uncomfortable. Now hold on just a minute. Jake couldn't hold in his anger even though he suspected the college president was trying to goad him into losing control. You can't be saying that I'm the only student enrolled here who's not some whiny little snowflake. Pelletier sniffed. Name-calling will gain you absolutely nothing, young man. Any other students who share some of your oppressive and unacceptable beliefs at least have the sense not to give voice to them where they would offend the sensibilities of other, more correct-thinking students and faculty. So the right of free speech only extends to liberals? The older man waved that off. This isn't the time or the place to argue the wisdom or even the necessity of a constitution put into place by white slaveholders. I'm saying that I received a number of complaints about you, Mr. Rivers. Even before this latest incident, your wild-eyed raving has disturbed many of our faculty and students. <laughs> he was wild-eyed raving. <laughs> Is this what it's like to be a conservative? You're just trying to buy eggs and scream out loud how you think homosexuals don't get the right to marry and suddenly everyone thinks you're a monster just because you're spitting truth in the grocery store. God. It must be hard. It must be hard to not be allowed to believe what you want. Can't even do a little oppressing as a treat. It's Christmas. Let me oppress somebody. Liberals always got to be in here. No, wait, no, wait. They did oppress somebody on Christmas. That's right. Didn't Greg Abbott, like, bus a bunch of migrants and drop them off in the cold on Christmas Day? Man, how do you do that and even tell your... Like, you, you, you look in the mirror and you're like, yeah, I'm the villain. I am. I'm the bad guy. Anyway, sorry. 
not to make it real. Okay, anyway. Texas, right? Texas. <sighs> but no, he's he's the oppressed one somehow. Yeah, this is Fly and Arlene's backstory. Maybe? Except I think they're gonna bang. I think him and Dr. Dr. Burke. I think he's gonna get it in, and it's gonna be awesome. I'm excited to hear this author describe them having sex. I hope that I hope that there's like farming terminology. He's gonna talk about how I hope the author talks about how thoroughly he plows her fields, how deeply he plants seeds, like he's got a strong farming back. That's what I want to hear about. <laughs> uh, anyway. It's gonna be like four chapters long. Yeah, except there, it's like a half a page per chapter. <laughs> uh anyway, it's it's gotta be coming. I mean that in both senses of the word. Wild-eyed raving is what we just said. All right. Wild-eyed raving? Jake sounded astonished because he was. Ever since he had arrived on campus, started his classes, and realized what sort of place Kelton was, he had bitten his tongue and held in what he wanted to say many more times than he could count. But not the one where he was choking some dude out, slamming his spine on the ground, and screaming about how he was about to start a civil war. <laughs> not that part. All the other times. Except I actually don't think he's ever held in his opinion once in this book so far. Actually, not once. Has he ever actually suppressed anything? Anyway. Pelletier put, picked up a piece of paper from the desk in front of him, looked at what was evidently a list printed on it, and said, You were heard to cast doubt on the validity of Keynesian economics. I'm taking an econ class. We're supposed to discuss things like that. You told another student that in your opinion, all lives matter. Are you saying they don't? <laughs> Pelletier ignored that question and went on. You claim to be proud of your military service. Why wouldn't I be? This modern army isn't always what I wish it was. But what's wrong with serving your country and being proud that you did? Pelletier didn't answer that one. And Pelletier didn't answer that one either. Instead, he glared at Jake and said, In history class, you expressed admiration for Ronald Reagan. <laughs> I said he was a lot better president than a lot of the bozos who came after him. Do students, do students give up the right to have an opinion when they go to school here? Of course not. Uh, oh, I said it wrong. I said that in the wrong way. Of course not. Pelletier bristled. As long as... As long as they're the right opinions. Jake broke in. The politically correct opinions. The ones that fit your precious narrative. Pelletier slapped the paper back down on the desk. Young man, you will not speak to me in such a disrespectful tone. Do you understand? I am still president of this college. Jake drew in a deep breath so sharply that his nostrils flared. He sat there until his hands unclenched from fists and his pulse wasn't hammering quite so hard in his head. Then he said, I apologize, sir. You're right. I should respect the office. But not the man! Pelletier snapped. He made another curt gesture. Never mind. Let's get down to business. I want you to withdraw from this institution. You're kicking me out for no good reason except you don't like my politics? I think I could fight that with a lawsuit. You violated our code of conduct in numerous ways. Pelletier lifted his chin and sniffed again. I think we would be perfectly justified in expelling you, and any court would agree with our action. However, I would prefer that you withdraw of your own accord. Jake sat back and grinned. You're trying to keep my grandfather from getting too upset with you. You don't want to lose all the donations he makes to the school. I have the utmost respect for Cordell Gardner. And even more respect for his money. Jake paused and thought for a second, then went on. If I withdraw, you can tell my grandfather was my own decision. Then you can turn around and imply to all the people suing you that you forced me out in hopes of getting me more favorable terms when you settle those suits. Or getting more favorable terms when you settle those suits. 
You're trying to play it both ways. Pelletier glared but didn't deny the accusation. Instead, he said, Are you going to deny or are you going to withdraw or not, Mr. Rivers? Not, Jake said. I'll stick it out. Very well, Pelletier said, clearly not pleased with the decision. You'll get no support from this institution in dealing with your own legal problems. We are washing our hands of you. Careful, Jake said. That's a biblical reference. Remember what Pilate said when the Jews asked him what to do about Jesus? You wouldn't want anybody to accuse you of being a Christian. That's a dirty word these days, isn't it? We're done here. Yeah, I think we are. Jake got to his feet and started to turn towards the door, then stopped. What about those other four guys? What four guys? What are you talking about? The fight in the plaza. Oh, when you attacked that young couple, then fought with that group of peaceful bystanders? Peaceful bystanders? A bunch of hooded goons with chains and pipes? That wasn't a quote. That's just a narration. Crab foam, thanks for gifting a sub. Oh, Jatholomew, thank you. J part, thank you. I think I thank you, but I'm thanking you again. All right. <sighs> Clearly, though, Patelier was talking about what had happened earlier in the evening. Not the clash when Jake was on his way back to Olmstead Hall from Frank McCraney's office. And he seemed genuinely puzzled as well. But why make things worse for himself, Jake thought. Maybe despite the fact that he had thought of thought them incapable of it. Those four sons of bitches had been able to haul themselves off after all. In that case, as long as Natalie Burke hadn't reported it, it was possible nobody else knew about that second fight. And there wasn't a cover-up after all. Might as well let it stay that way, he decided. Never mind, Jake said. There's nothing else, sir. I have a class in 20 minutes. You're determined to remain enrolled here? Yes, sir, I am. Then please try not to cause any more trouble. I never set out to cause it, Jake said, but I'm not going to run away from it either. Good lord, you sound like John Wayne. Jake grinned and said, I'll take that as a compliment. As he opened the door and went out. Ooh, got him. Ooh, he's snarking on him. John Wayne. I have not seen a single movie that I've enjoyed with John Wayne in it. I don't think he, he might be one of the most bafflingly unentertaining leading men that I've ever seen. I don't get it. Anyway, chapter nine complete. Bonus chapter complete. And we're only, let's see, you're 38 subs away. Oh no, God. 38 subs away from chapter 10. <sighs> every encounter is, is beautiful. I like how every single encounter and event in this book completely validates a very specific... It's not even really a set of values. It's just things that you don't like. It just dunks on all of them. It's just dunks. But it doesn't replace it with anything valuable. It's just dunking on other things. I don't know. <laughs> it's awesome. It's so awesome. Literature. That means it's time to read chapter 10 of Trigger Warning. Chapter 10. Matthias Foster peered over the sights of the heavy double-action revolver in his hand and squeezed the trigger. The gun boomed and the heavy recoil tried to make the barrel rise up, but Foster's strong two-handed grip controlled it. He fired again, fast but not rushing, then again. The target, set up 20 yards away in front of a thick barrier of earth and wooden beams, showed three holes grouped close together a bit low and left from the bullseye. Foster lowered the revolver onto the wooden counter in front of him where a number of other pistols, some revolvers and semi-automatics, lay waiting. He knew he might well be trusting his life to some of these weapons, whether he held them or not, so he intended to check the sights and firing mechanisms of all of them. He left the protective wraparound plastic goggles, goggles on, but lowered the ear protectors so they wrapped around his neck from behind. This one needs a little adjustment to the sights. He told the woman, who stood behind him holding a tablet. Using a stylus, 
she made a note on whatever's on the next page. The screen. That's where the note is. Can Bruce out drink you? This is an odd this is an odd topic to fixate on if you're the same person who asked before. I would actually I would actually at this at this point I would say probably. I would say probably yeah. Alright. Oh, we lost Daisy again. Okay. She wore custom earbuds with speakers built into them as well as noise suppression circuitry. So her ears were protected from the sound of guns going off, but she could still hear what her companion was saying without removing the buds. Very cool. We've been at this for a while, Matthias, she said. A smile appeared on his handsome face. Preparation, my dear Lucy. Proper preparation is the key to success. Forgive me for sounding like a motivational speaker. He didn't look like a motivational speaker. He wore jeans and a faded blue work shirt with the sleeves rolled up over wiry but strong-looking forearms. His head was topped by a shock of wavy brown hair. In an earlier day, he would have been considered movie star handsome. His deep tan testified that he spent a lot of time outside. He could have been a farmer or a ranch hand. His voice was deep, powerful, cultured, with a touch of the didactic about it. Of course, the woman called Lucy replied. But we have other things to do to get ready too, besides just testing guns. You're right, Foster agreed. We have other powerful weapons on our side. Our brains. He touched his forehead and our hearts. His fingertips rested for a second on his chest. Those are a higher caliber than any mechanical weapon we might employ, and we must test them well. He laughed. God, I sound pretentious at times, don't I? Lucy smiled and said, some people respond to that. True. Ah, true. And it's also true that facing such a great undertaking as we are... We need to test our resolve. He was looking past her as he said it. Here comes such a test now. Space Witch, thank you for the sub. Lucy turned and gazed along a dirt road that led to the outdoor shooting range nestled in the central Texas hills. A cloud of dust rose from the uh, a cloud of dust rose from the road as the vehicle approached. This range was on private property, and the entrance was guarded, so no one could be driving along that road who wasn't supposed to be here. Even so, a tiny shiver of apprehension went through her. The vehicle, a nondescript white SUV with a layer of grime on it, came into sight. As it came closer, Foster gestured towards the tablet in Lucy's hand and said, Tell, Col tell Khaled to get to work on those as soon as he can. Of course. Would you like me to go, Matthias? He shook his head. No, stay here. You might find this interesting. Lucy set the tablet on the long open air counter that was covered by a metal roof supported by wooden posts. She and Foster both turned toward the SUV as it came to a stop 20 yards away. Lucy reached up and started to take the earbud out of her right ear, but Foster stopped her. Leave them in, he said. You might need them again later. Lucy looked puzzled, but shrugged in acceptance of what he said. Whew. Four men got out of the SUV and walked towards them. All were in their 20s, one black, one Hispanic, two white. Important details, I guess. All wore the same sort of casual clothes as Foster and Lucy. The black guy and one of the white guys wore sunglasses as well. The other white guy and the Hispanic had gotten out of the SUV's back seat. Thanks. Yeah, werewolf. You've called it. It's important because they're about to get shot, but yes. In fact, that is, I'm sure, the case. <sighs> Jimmy, Hank. Foster greeted the two in sunglasses with a nod, then smiled at the other two, 
Carlos, Ben. Ben, a rangy young man with blonde hair, grinned. We here to get... <laughs> we here to get in some target practice, Matthias? That's right, Foster answered. We need to be sure that everyone can handle what's expected of them once we get this thing started. There won't be any turning back, you know. Nobody wants to turn back, Ben said. We're all committed to the cause, aren't we, guys? He turned his head to look at the three young men who had come out here with him. Sure we are, the black guy Jimmy said. The only way to stop those fascists from taking over the country and ruining it is to fight back against them with something they'll understand. Force, Carlos said. The same sort of oppression they deal out to us. You know they put us all in death camps if they thought they could get away with it, Hank added. Ben nodded and said, sure they would. Racist, sexist, homophobic bigots, that's all they are. Every single one of them. You're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Foster laughed. That's an old, old line, buddy. Where'd you read that? It was in one of your posts online, wasn't it? Ben asked with a frown. You know what? Maybe it was. I say so many things, it's hard to keep track of them. You know what they say. There's truth behind every cliché. Ben turned towards the range counter with a gun spread out on it. So, let's do some shooting. Wait, hold on. Ben... Foster, okay. Yeah, okay, sorry. I was worried for a second that I... I was misattributing quotes, but no, Matthias is joking up to have a real, or Matthias is building up to have a real joker moment. Is it Matthias or Matthias? It's probably Matthias, right? That you just, the H is just gone. He's got to have an aggravating name to aggravate the conservatives. Matthias. Oh. Oh. Well, now we're all over the place. Hold on. A new challenger has emerged. Okay. Math. This person's saying Matthias. 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 Google says Matthias. I'm going to say Matthias. We'll just go with that. That was a very soothing, soothing voice. I, I trust it. I believe in it. Okay. There's truth behind every cliche. Ben turned towards the range counter with a gun spread on it. So let's do some shooting. Hold on, hold on. Foster said as he held up a hand, still smiling, he went on. I need to ask you about something first. Sure, just don't ask me if I'm committed, because I am. I'm ready to go through with all this. I gave you my word on that. So I can trust you, Foster asked. Absolutely, 100%. Then I know you'll tell me the truth when I ask... When I ask you... Why you drove into Austin last night? Ben frowned a little. You didn't say we couldn't. We were supposed to go on about our business normally until the time comes, right? That's not exactly an answer. Well, I just, I needed to buy a few things, that's all. There are more places to shop in Austin than there are in Greenleaf. You went to a shopping center, all right, Foster said. But you didn't go into any of the stores. Ben was starting to look angry now. How the hell do you know that? Have you been having me followed, Matthias? I thought you trusted all of us. You wouldn't have brought us in on this if you didn't. I do trust you. I trust you to tell me 
who that guy was you met in the parking lot and what was on that flash drive you gave him. I don't know what you're talking about, Ben said with a stubborn shake of his head. I didn't meet some guy. I didn't give, I didn't give anybody a flash drive. Really? Foster reached in his pocket, took something out, and flipped it through the air to Ben, who reached up and caught it instinctively. He lowered his hand, opened it, and stared at the little flash drive in his palm. Foster went on. Sorry if it's a little sticky. It's got some blood on it. Lucy's eyes widened. She took half a step back toward the counter with the guns on it and said, M Matthias, what, what is this? He lifted a hand toward her gently. Nothing for you to worry about, he said in reassuring tones. I'm just trying to find out how loyal Ben is to the rest of us. You know damn well I'm loyal, Ben said angrily. He waved his left hand toward the counter. Didn't I help you get some of these guns right there? Didn't I put my own ass on the line delivering drugs for you? Weed, Foster said with a scornful tone in his voice. Hell, in some states what you did wasn't even illegal, man. Getting those untraceable guns was... And I appreciate it. We all do. But I still want to know about that flash drive. It's encrypted, so we couldn't get into it. Yet. But we'll crack it sooner or later. And if I decide to go to that much... Or if I decide to go to that much trouble. Not sure that would be worth it since I've got a hunch there are a bunch of names on there. My name. And Hank's. And Jimmy's. And Carlos's. Maybe even pretty little Lucy's. What about it, Ben? I still don't know what you're talking about. I, do I don't know what else to tell you, Matthias. <laughs> All right. Foster laughed and spread his hands. What the hell? Whatever's on that drive, it can't hurt us, right? And neither can the guy who had it. So it's all moot, right? You're still with us. If you'd really betrayed us, you'd be in the wind by now. You wouldn't have come out like this. You don't have the stones for that, my friend. No offense. Ben grunted. Yeah, I, I think maybe I am offended, but I don't care. You've gotten things mixed up, Matthias, and you'll realize that sooner or later. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're right. Foster turned to the counter, picked up a 9mm semi-automatic pistol, and tossed it to Ben. There you go. Let's see what you can do with that target practice you were talking about. Ben had caught the pistol deftly. With practiced ease, he thumbed the button in the side of the weapon, dropped the magazine from the butt, and looked at it to be sure it was loaded. He slid it back into place, pulled the slide back to eject the round that was in the chamber, and then let it go back forward to load another round. Then he stepped over to the counter to face the targets, but he stood there only for a second before he turned quickly and pointed the gun at Lucy's head. It's time. I can't believe it, Ben. She gasped in surprise and fear and took a step back. Drop them now, Ben said. All the guns you got on you, throw them on the ground, I'll kill her, I will! None of the other men seemed surprised. Foster, in fact, was smiling as he shook his head and said, No, you won't. You're one of the good guys, Ben. FBI, Homeland, hell. Maybe even a Texas Ranger. You're just not about to shoot some innocent girl in the head, and we all know it. Ben grimaced and swung the, swung the gun toward Foster. He jerked the trigger. Nothing happened. A gun being loaded doesn't do any good if the firing mechanism has been disabled, Foster said. You should have checked that too. Wide-eyed with sudden terror, Ben threw the inoperative pistol aside and tried to twist towards the other guns on the counter. Before he could reach any of them, Jimmy, Hank, and Carlos opened fire with the pistols they had drawn from under their shirts. The bullets, some forty-five caliber and some 9mm, plowed into Ben's back and pitched him forward. 
He fell short of the counter and lay on his face, twitching as blood pumped from the holes in his back. The spasms lasted for maybe ten seconds and then stopped. Foster hadn't fired a weapon of his own. He stepped over to Lucy, who was pale and shaken, and lifted a hand to cup her chin as he smiled. I'm sorry about that, he said, but you know I never would have let him hurt you. I was bait, she said. Not exactly. He could have tried to shoot any of us. I just wanted him to show his true colors, and he did. And now we know. He put his arm around Lucy's shoulders. Come on. The guys will take care of cleaning this up. You and I can go back to town and leave them to their work. Somebody might have heard all those shots. It's a shooting range. That's what we do here. Foster smiled. Target practice. Oh, sick. Now we have our villain. And that ends chapter 10. You know, you know the villain's good when he kills one of his own dudes to show how hardcore he is. He didn't technically do that, though. He didn't blast him himself for insubordination. Like, there has to be, there has to be some slight failure so the villain can, like, roll out and just ice a dude. Good stuff. Ugh, okay. The next sub-extension is a bonus. We'll have two chapters. I'll tease that out. Tease that out for real. Just because the chapters are pretty short. Okay, let's get back. Let's get back into the twisted and tragic tale of Jake Rivers. Jacob Rivers. Army Ranger Jake Rivers. <coughs> I, pan I like ate a sandwich really fast. Half a sandwich really fast. I didn't want to do a whole sandwich. Didn't want you guys to wait too long. But it's still kind of doing its thing. <coughs> God damn. Can we get a recap? Yes, you can. Jake Rivers is an army ranger and he needs an education. He was convinced by his billionaire grandfather to go to college because his billionaire grandfather never did. And Jake's a bit of a loose cannon. Joined the army, got a chest full of medals. Before that, got into trouble because he liked driving fast and banging MILFs. So he joined the army to avoid jail time. He was an amazing army dude, like the best, the coolest, coolest dude. He joined college to try to figure out what he wanted to do with his life. While at college, reading a book that was trying to indoctrinate him about the evils of capitalism, he hears a scuffle outside. He goes outside because he's a gentleman. He witnesses a domestic incident, a man slapping a woman, and he's a gentleman. He won't sit by and let that happen, so he gets involved. He ends up getting jumped by a gang of feral, rabid, Antifa, liberal gang members that have bike chains and shit. He beats them all up with his army skills. Campus PD tases him. He's released from Campus PD because he... His grandfather is friends with the police chief... So our bootstraps, uh, our bootstraps did it with him, his own steam uh, conservative hero, comes from money and is protected by the cops. And yet somehow he's the persecuted one. That, that shit is all like straight up the part of the, the backstory. It's great. He talks about how patient he's being, but he's also gotten into fights with nearly everybody he's come across. And Tifer tried to beat him up with pronouns. Yeah. So he literally beat them up in return. Maybe like, uh, almost killed a dude. So let's see here. What else happened? Uh, the president called Jake into his office, tried to convince him to voluntarily leave the college. Jake wasn't having that. He realized that the president was trying to play a game. So Jake said, no, I'm staying. Just to spite you fucking shitty liberals. The last chapter, they introduced who we assume is the villain. Villain? Matthias. I started thinking about how to say Matthias in my head when I said villain, so it went ma violin Violin? Whatever. Matthias. Matthias and a gang uh, of four generals. 
Ben, Carlos. Oh, who are the other ones? Because you know that Jake's going to have to fight him like one on one over the course of the story, right? Like they're Mega Man bosses. Anyway, it turns out Ben was a fucking narc. So Matthias had him gunned down by the other three stooges. But Matthias totally didn't care because he... We don't know what his motivation is yet. He's like a magnanimous ultra smart villain who's pretty clearly manipulating uh, like the, the weird nationalist dudes. Jimmy, the black guy. Okay. Carlos, the Hispanic guy. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna be grateful that the black guy is not named Leroy, because you know that that was probably like choice number one. And the editor was like, "Come on, dial it back just a little bit." He might be a super anarchist. Yeah, he might be full Joker. Who knows? I'm hoping he's just fully Jokerized. Like, uh, like I think the thing is. Okay, uh, we're getting into like parts of the book I haven't read, so this is just full full uh, prediction mode, but. The worst kind of villain you can usually have in a conservative book is like somebody who was army, but is now betraying the American government. And they're usually, it's usually because they're like bitter about the lack of, of like fame that they got coming back. It's like the worst thing, right? Well, I mean, yeah, race trader. You have to be, you have to be implicit about that part. You can't say that part out loud, but yes, also that. Um, so I'm going to guess that he's like, he's a, Matthias, I guess, is a uh, a veteran who was probably like like military brass, right? Like like not a grunt. Didn't get his didn't get his hands dirty. He doesn't do that because he's a fucking coward. He just tells people what to do. But yeah, anyway, he's just like some some shitty desk jockey who's pissed off that his pension didn't get paid out or something. Oh, I, okay. How about this? He was selling secrets. He was selling secrets to the Russians, Chinese. I'm trying to guess which one they would they would pick. Saudis, 2017. He was selling government secrets to the Saudis. He was found out, so he ran, got a new, got a new identity, and now is like trying to destabilize the government. But that makes it seem like the liberals aren't the ones destabilizing the government, so that's tough. Because it's definitely going to have to be the liberals are still a problem. It's like, how can he be a villain when the villain is actually the liberals? But I don't think it's just, I don't think he's just like an ultra lib uh, anarchist. He might be. The writing has already, the writing is having fun with him as a character versus like depicting him as, as a savage killer. So I, there's got to be some twist to it. I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess the most cowardly thing you can do is like the diehard play. Where it's like he's not motivated by anything political and doesn't represent anything. Like he's just a thief. He's after the gold in the, in the college vault. You know, some, some shit like that. We'll see. We'll see where that goes. It can really go anywhere. Chapter 11. We'll see. We'll see. I'm kind of hoping for the confrontation between Jake and Matthias. Because I think it'll happen over a radio. That's, what, that's where like every, everything that's copying Die Hard does. They have like a shit talk over the radio. Or like maybe through a through a pane of bulletproof glass, you know, there has to be some like moment where they confront each other, but they're separated. Uh, okay, chapter eleven. Yeah, when they start debating, I'm excited about that. This seems like a shit version of Toy Soldiers. You know, you're the second person to mention Toy Soldiers. Sidebar: That movie is dope. It's actually super dope. Toy Soldiers is really good. I remember just kind of watching it. I remember weirdly, like at the time I was super into Star Trek. So I was like, oh, Will Wheaton's in this. All right. Um, and remember, like, I, th I think I saw it when I was like 12. And if you're expecting like uh, Red Dawn and you watch Toy Soldiers, it's like, fuck. I think Red Dawn was trying to be Toy Soldiers. Anyway, good movie. I don't remember if it's as brutal. Like my kid brain remembers it being pretty brutal, but I don't know if it actually is. Can you read Cordell's lines as a grizzled old prospector? Uh, I can. Where you, yeah, I guess that, that might be a punch up from the, uh, from the like boots and belt buckle old Texas man I was doing before. Muffle Wuff, thank you for the bits. Well, tarnation. Sure, yeah. Why not? I don't know. I guess he's going to have lines. He would probably know. Grizzlomic, yeah.
Okay, <clears throat> chapter 11. When, <clears throat> when Jake answered a knock on the door of his dorm room the evening of his abrasive meeting with President Andrew Pelletier, he was surprised to see his grandfather, oh, <sighs> grandfather standing there in the hall. Cordell, he said, using the old man's first name like he often did. What are you doing here? I came to see you, of course. And to bail your stubborn ass out of trouble, you gonna let me in? Jake stepped back out of the doorway. Sure, come on in. Even though he was several inches taller and considerably, considerably heavier than his grandfather, he still felt a little intimidated by the old man. I guess you uh, heard about the trouble a few days ago. Be hard not to, Gardner said as he closed the door behind him. Well, I don't do that, what you call it, social media stuff myself. But everybody who works for me does. And you made yourself famous, boy. Or infamous, depending on who's doing the talking. <clears throat> Hold on, let me... It's so weird, I, like, I have to position my mic. Then also give myself, like, clearance to see the book. Sorry about the rustling. I didn't do anything wrong, Jake said firmly. I was defending somebody else at first, and after that I was sticking up for myself. I seem to remember both my grandfathers telling me that's what I'm supposed to do. When somebody else starts a fight, you make damn sure you finish it, the old man growled. Not quite a growl, but whatever. Yeah, I can't argue with that. My secretary showed me some of the, some of the videos people shot on their phones. You did the right thing, son. Even so, I was going to let you handle it yourself. Let you navigate those treacherous waters. Figured you'd learn more that way. Gardner swept back the lapels of his western cut jacket and hooked his thumbs behind his belt. But that was before I found out you were about to have a whole swarm of locusts to send on you. Lawyers, I mean. Yeah, I figured that out, Jake said with a smile. They plan on coming in and stripping me clean, just like locusts. Gardner blew out a disparaging breath. You don't have a whole lot to be stripped away from you. You're not rich yet. I don't care if I ever am, Jake said. Wow, what a hero. Spoken like a boy whose family always had plenty of money. Jake would have argued with that just on general principles, but he supposed it was true. Wow, they're actually admitting it. Great. His father had been a very successful lawyer in Houston, and they had always had plenty of money, or so it seemed. Then drugs, booze, and hookers had leached off most of the available funds, which revealed just how fragile a foundation the family's finances had been built upon. Seeing his mother go through that was one of the reasons Jake had taken her last name and cut all ties with his father. He didn't, know, he didn't know where the man was now or if he was even still alive, although Jake suspected that Cordell Gardner kept up with his son, disowned or not. What do you want? The old man laughed harshly. You sound like you're not glad to see me. <laughs> the emotional resonance is a bit different. <laughs> I'm always happy to see you, you know that. But I know that you're not in the habit of just dropping in on people without good reason. That's true, I suppose, Gardner said with a shrug. Like I said, I heard rumors you were about to get hit with a bunch of lawsuits. Considering what I saw in that video, I'm not surprised. No charges were filed against me, Jake pointed out. The college didn't even take any real action against me. The president just urged me to withdraw. You told him where you could stick that, I imagine. Something like that. Well, no charges were ever filed against you because there's too much evidence that you were acting into self-defense when that mod of hood wearing bullies attacked you. That stuff came before the trouble with the fellow who was beating up his girlfriend. There doesn't seem to be any footage of that floating around, so it would be hard to prove anything in court, your word against theirs. But that's why there are civil suits. So things you can't prove in criminal court might get you addressed by a jury. The burden of proof is a lot lower in hell. Most civil cases are decided by the emotional state of the people in the jury box, not by the evidence. Oh, this is a lot of talking. So what do you think I should do? 
Gardner snorted. Well, I think you should say thank you to the old man who got you out of this mess. I got some contacts in the country count oh, God, the county courthouse to look into the matter. Find out who was going to file a suit against you and sick the fleet of lawyers on them to make them settlement offers. Some accepted the offers right off the bat, and others got spooked into it when my paper pushers started playing hardball. <laughs> I'm not saying that there might be more crawling out of the woodwork later on, but for now, anyway, it's over. I'm starting to blend into Herbert the pervert? I guess so. God. <laughs> I don't know what's going on anymore. Ugh. I need water. That's what's going on. Hey, Steph. What's up, Steph? How's it going? He's just having a little heart to heart with his grandpa. W Not yet. No. He hasn't started talking about the WW2. I don't I'm gonna guess that he never that served. <sighs> Texas Texas grandpas just don't talk. They just sit there and stare. They sip on their tea and they rock in their chair. And they sweat. And they just nod occasionally. Oh, <sighs> okay. Just like that, Jake stared. You bought them off. I took the most efficient, least expensive way in the long run. Oh, there were still some of the little bully boys you gave a thrashing to who wanted to take you to court and punish the big bad fascist. But once they had some dollar signs dangled in front of their faces, their progressive beliefs faded like a freaking dusting snow in Corpus Christi. <laughs> God. <laughs> That's a, that's a city in Texas. Jake shook his head in amazement. His pride made him say, I didn't ask for... <laughs> I didn't ask you for any help, you know. I don't sit around waiting for family to come begging, the old man snapped. Now what's this about Pelletier asking you to withdraw? Jake waved a hand. Forget it, I didn't go along with his suggestion, so it doesn't matter. I'm gonna stick it out and get my master's degree. And good for him. Decided you want to finish your education and prove your mind, did you? No, I'm just too damn stubborn to let anyone run me off, especially a bunch of whiny little snowflakes. That made a grin break out on Gardner's rugged face. He clapped a hand on Jake's upper arm and said, There you go, boy! I never liked anybody trying to tell me what to do either. Jake felt a little awkward about it, but he said, I do appreciate what you did. Don't get me wrong about that. I wouldn't have fought every one of those bastards in court. Or I would have, excuse me. I would have fought every one of those bastards in court. Damn right. But I can't afford much in the way of lawyers. The only thing is, won't they think they beat me since they took the settlements and got paid? They could think whatever they damn well please. A bunch of pajama boys strutting around and thinking they're tough doesn't mean a blasted thing to me. Gardner smiled. Pajama boys. Pajama boys. And some of them, the most obnoxious of the bunch, are going to get hit with some heavy lawsuits of their own in the next week or so. They can sue you for defending yourself against them. You could sue them for attacking you in the first place. Won't settlements make it seem like I was admitting that I was wrong? With that on the record, lawsuits like you're talking about would be hard to win. Yeah, they would if we pressed it. I just want them to get served with that paperwork. See the figure the suit is asking in damages and dribble down their legs while they're counting the zeros. Jake looked at his grandfather for a moment, then laughed. <laughs> You're a vicious old man. How do you think I made so much money? Jake didn't answer that. Instead, he said, Why don't we go out and get a beer? You can bring your driver and your bodyguards along. Spend the evening in some college hangout? Thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> There's gold in them hills. It's not exactly the malt shop anymore. Jake said. Maybe not, but I'll still pass. The old man pointed to the desk where open books were spread out and a computer and a tablet were both on. And you've got some studying to do from the looks of it. Get back to work. I didn't go to all that trouble just to have you flunk out. Don't worry about that. I'm not. I know you're carrying a 4.0 average. You have spies everywhere, don't you? Gardner just grinned, waved, and left the room. 
Jake went back to the desk and tried to concentrate on what he'd been working on, but it wasn't easy. He was both relieved and annoyed that his grandfather had stepped in to save him from a barrage of lawsuits that would have sucked up all his time and money and ensured, and ensured that he wasn't able to continue at Kelton College. His pride was a little wounded, but his practical side knew it was a good thing. Another knock sounded on the door. Jake pushed his chair back, stood up, and stepped across the room to open it. He expected to see his grandfather standing there again, and said, Changed your mind about getting that beer? I... Actually, I didn't, because no one's asked me to go get a beer. Dr. Natalie Burke said, but Now that you mention it, I think it sounds like an excellent idea. Caged money! Thanks for gifting five subs. That would be the end of chapter 11, but no! Bonus! Chapter 12. Jake didn't want to be impolite and stare, but it was difficult not to do so. Got me a little red hand. She wears a tight shirt. She got really pale skin. And she don't talk back. Was the doctor wearing her anime armor? Pfft. It's, this is the this will be the version of anime armor, but for conservative men. For the ones who are running away from what they want, which is cat girls. You want cat girls, but you can't admit that to yourself, so instead you buy trigger warning. Maybe cat boys. Chapter 12. Jake didn't... Oh, yeah. Hard to not stare. A tight white blouse and a black pencil skirt. No, I'm gonna... Okay, red hair. I'm gonna... I kind of remember this part. I kind of remember them going to the bar. Uh, I'm gonna guess she's just wearing a really tight sweater. Like, it has to reveal her figure but not be slutty. That's the rule. So it's like a really tight form-fitting sweater, but it, like, covers up the neck and the arms, right? Because that's for the bedroom. Only once you get married. Yeah, turtleneck. Turtleneck, but somehow it's like vacuum sealed so you can see all of every ounce of her titties. All right, Dr. Burke. Dr. Burke, or rather Natalie, since doctor sounded too stuffy for somebody who looked like she did, wore a pair of tight tan jeans and a long sleeved green silk shirt. Her hair fell in reddish gold waves around her pretty face. What? Stuff, what? Okay, so long sleeve, but silk, so very thin. What? Still, he didn't want to be rude, so he used her title as he said, I didn't expect to see you here, Dr. Burke. Why? Do you think there's something inappropriate about it? Female students and faculty have to follow the same guidelines as the males as far as relationships are concerned. I didn't know we had a relationship other than being acquainted. And aren't you forgetting about the gender fluid and all the other two dozen alternative lifestyles? She laughed. Ha ha ha! That is stupid. <laughs> we agree that's dumb. Well, we can have a laugh about it. Oh my god. Anyway. She laughed. So you have read the guidelines. Yeah, but I haven't exactly studied them rigorously. That's all right. If you happen to violate one of them, someone will let you know in no uncertain terms. Possibly even with a megaphone. And the scarlet letters R, B, S, and H. What does that mean? Oh, no, he's going to explain it. Natalie frowned and cocked her head to the side for a second before she understood. Then she said, Ah, racist, bigot, sexist, homophobe. You left out C for cishet. You are cishet, aren't you? that what they used to call straight? That's right. Then yeah, you can add the C in there. Acting on impulse, he added, What about that beer? Unless it's frowned upon for faculty and students to fraternize. Do you care about being frowned upon? Jake shook his head. Not really. Well, neither do I. <laughs> do you care about being frowned upon? That's what, uh... That's what being conservative means. Somebody's frowning upon you.
I like how they're actively being transphobic and then making a joke about how somebody would call them transphobic. Yeah, because the joke is they're not allowed... Like, it's it's ridiculous to even question it, and it's ridiculous that somebody would, like, actively question them for doing it. Both are absurd. And they don't see that in the intersection is just being a shitty person. That's the middle of the Venn diagram. God. Just incredible. All right. Let me get my jacket. Jake didn't much like going out with... Wait. Jake didn't much like going out without being armed, especially after the recent troubles. As a private institution, Kelton College had the right under law to prohibit carrying weapons of all kinds. Public universities, which received tax funds, had to abide by the law of the state of Texas that allowed citizens to bear arms. Gross. The news media, oh yeah, that was always really weird going to college in Texas. And every time I walked into the library, there'd be a big sign saying, like, firearms aren't allowed. And it was always a really gross sign to see when you're going into a library. Don't bring a fucking gun into the library. I don't know. It doesn't make me feel like I'm in a civilized land. If you have to tell people, leave your guns outside. Library. Anyway. The book might attack you. Yeah, I have a rat. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just saying, it didn't make me feel good seeing the signs. The news media, the academic world, and the left in general had freaked out over that legislation, shrieking that the state's colleges and universities were going to become the site of frequent bloody shootouts. Well, thank God that never happened. Of course that hadn't happened. Sure, just as all of the liberals' doomsday predictions about all sorts of things, from global warming to the population explosion, had failed to come to pass. When a provision was added to the law allowing Texans to carry openly, it was the end of the world as we know it, according to some. People would be blasting away at each other constantly. That couldn't be allowed to happen. Just think of the children. Instead, Jake could count on the fingers of one hand how many times he had seen someone open carrying in normal day-to-day -day life. Everyone he knew who had been carrying concealed continued to do so, as he himself did in the places where he was allowed to, and where technically he wasn't allowed to. With an inside-the-waistband holster and the comfortably fitting shirts he wore, nobody had to know he was armed unless it was necessary. He also had several small but deadly combat knives he carried on occasion. He knew some older men, including his grandfather, had carried at least a pocket knife every day of their lives for 50 years or more until the rise of the nanny state and its metal detectors had created too much of a hassle for them. Jake had a couple of guns in his dorm room. They weren't supposed to be there, but he wanted to have them handy anyway. He didn't try to take one of them with him tonight, though. Instead, as he slipped his jacket on, he felt the comforting weight of the folding knife in one of the pockets. The blade, when it was opened, was a little less than three inches long, but in the hands of an expert. And Jake was an expert. That was more than enough to be deadly. He smiled at Natalie as he closed the door behind them and started along the hall toward the stairs which Jake habitually took instead of the elevator, both for the exercise and because he didn't care for tight, enclosed places. Where would you like to go? Oh, wait. Wrong quote. Where would you like to go? Jake is a gentleman. Of course he would ask. He asked Natalie. The shamrock is close, she said. Is that all right with you? Sure, he said. The shamrock was only a couple of blocks off campus. It advertised itself as an authentic Irish pub, but was really only about as authentic as any bar and grill that was owned by a, a corporation could be. Still, it was pleasant enough, or it had been the one time Jake was in there. The beer was good, bar food wasn't bad. The lighting was subdued enough that it would be nice to sit with Natalie in one of the booths and talk. They were likely to be noticed, but he didn't care for his own sake. Oh, hold on a minute. They were likely to be noticed, but he didn't care for his own sake. He had never been the type to give a damn what anybody thought about him. And since she was the one who'd suggested the place, she was probably all right with that, too. Jake got beers for them at the bar, and they took them to an empty booth towards the back of the big room laid out around a horseshoe bar. 
They sat down across the table from each other and Natalie raised her bottle. To a world that will someday be normal again, she said. That's an odd toast, Jake said, but I can't argue with it. They clinked bottles together and drank. If you want normal though, you're not going to find it on a college campus, he said. Not these days. If Kelton's any example, and from what I read online, it is. Those places are hotbeds of crazy. Natalie shrugged and said, They've changed a lot, even in the short time that I've been teaching. Things that seemed over the top and ridiculous a dozen years ago are commonplace now. You've been teaching a dozen years? I find that hard to believe. She smiled and said, Maybe I'm a little older than I look. If you call me a cougar, though, I'll report you for hate speech. Wouldn't dream of it, Jake said. To tell the truth, even though she was older than him, they seemed about the same age. He had always been an old soul. His grandfather had told him once, and everything he and his mother had gone through with his father had aged him even more. You suddenly look very solemn, Natalie said. This is supposed to be the banter part of the evening. Sorry, I was just thinking about some things. Family, mostly. She drank some more beer from the beer bottle and then said, I know who you are. Jake cocked an eyebrow and said, I told you my name, so... I should have said, I know who your grandfather is. I told you the first time we met that there are rumors about you, about how you must be related to somebody important. I'd say Cordell Gardner certainly qualifies. Jake's forehead creased. How'd you know about that? I teach criminal justice, remember? You have to know a little about police procedure and how to poke around and find out things. I don't like to talk about it, he said, shaking his head. I don't want people thinking I'm getting breaks or being treated differently because of who my relatives are. But you are, Natalie said. And that's just the way of the world, Jake. People who have more wealth and power or whose families have more wealth and power are treated differently. Some people who are obsessed with trying to make everything in the world fair don't like that. But there's nothing really they can do about it. They've been trying for hundreds of years, but haven't been able to do, or haven't been able to. This is deep. This is getting so deep. What year is this book based in again? 2017. That's when it was published, and I assume it's current day. Oh, so they admit that there's a classist divide, you think? No, I think he's probably gonna, he's probably gonna zing her really hard. And she'll have to laugh it off because it's her job to make him feel smart. She has to accept all of his dumb ideas and validate them. That's what she's there for. Anyway. They've been for 100 years. Okay. They, people haven't been able to change the classist society. Jake says, Maybe so, but I don't have to take advantage of it. Although that was just what he was doing. Okay, good. I'm glad the book at least acknowledges this much. Jake thought with a trace of bitter taste in his mouth that had nothing to do with the beer. He was going to allow his grandfather to make those lawsuits go away, even though it still felt to him like he was admitting that he had done something wrong. The old man was a bottom line sort of guy, though. The cheapest and most efficient way to accomplish anything was the best way, as far as he was concerned. Why don't we just change the subject, at least sort of, Natalie suggested. Still on family, tell me about your parents and your brothers and sisters. No brothers or sisters, I'm an only child. My father was a lawyer in Houston. My mother, well, my mother married my father. I hate to sum up anybody like that, but it's about all you can say about her. That's all you can say about an entire human. Is that they are connected to a man. <laughs> yeah, love you, mom. He took her last name. But only to spite his dad, not because of anything his mom did. Man, every woman in this book so far is just like a cutout, just like a standee, a cardboard standee. Uh, is she from Houston as well? He shook his head. New Orleans. Her father owned a trucking company there that carried freight all over the country. He passed away a long time ago, though. Oh, someone in chat mentioned that's a reference to another William W. Johnstone book series. 
This is apparently a whole universe. Let's see here. But your folks are still alive? My mother is. I honestly don't know about my father. Natalie nodded. I caught it, you said... Or I caught it when you said he was a lawyer. What happened? Jake gestured with the hand that held the beer bottle. A uh, big scandal. He got disbarred because... Sorry. He got disbarred because it came out he'd been heavily involved with drugs and had a lot of gambling debts. He was paid... He was paid off to tank some big cases he worked on. He probably should have been sent to jail, but they wound up just not letting him practice law anymore. My mother divorced him and took back her maiden name. I decided to follow her example. I'd lost all respect for my father, so I didn't want to be carrying around his name. Hold on. He lost all respect for his father, but he can still find more words to describe him than he married my mother. Anyway. So I got it legally changed and took the name of my maternal grandfather instead. Oh wait, he did- okay. Maternal grandfather. He still had to go to the man's side. Big Joe Rivers was a good man for all I've heard about him. I barely remember the man myself. He scowled across the table. How the hell do you get me talking so much about myself? I never do that. She smiled and said, I'm easy to talk to, I guess. You are at that. Any other relatives? Determined, aren't you? Nosy. Well, you've run up against a brick wall now. My mother had two brothers, but they're both dead. One went nuts and died in an asylum. I know, I'm an insensitive lout. But at least I didn't call it a loony bin. And my other uncle was killed in an explosion. Natalie raised her eyebrows and said, An explosion? Yeah, the blast blew up him and his wife. I was too little to know anything about it at the time, but later on I heard rumors it was mob-related. That's terrible. I'm sure Uncle Barry and his wife thought so too when they got blown up. <laughs> and now you're being terrible. I think I've heard enough about your family. And I've said more than enough about him, that's for sure. Tell me about yours instead. My family? She smiled. I come from a long line of madmen. We are Irish, you know. Of course she's Irish. Red hair, alabaster skin. Why do conservative dudes love women from the British Isles? I don't get it. They just want, like... I don't get it. Anyway. The best kind of mad, Jake said as he grinned and raised the bottle in his hand. <laughs> white. I mean, yeah, white, but like, I guess it's like white, but majestic. They want like a mat. It's, it's like their version of Magic Pixie Dream Girl. <laughs> if you could change your fit. Exactly. Ladies wandering the moors. With their long flowing gowns. Pale. Beautifully pale. Yeah, exotic white. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Spain, too saucy. They might... They might fight back. They might stab your ass. I guess it's like... You can, you can put the like domestic... Domestic goddess pattern over it most believably. Yeah. Anyway, that's the end of chapter 12. Australia's the spicy white. <laughs> Sriracha? Sriracha white? Okay, let's get back to the game.